good afternoon. It is 1 p.m. and we are going to start the Board of Regents meetings of Del Mar College on Tuesday, April 10th. <coughs> Convening, uh, we do have a quorum, so I'll call the meeting to order. And if we could begin with, please, a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, Dr. Adami, would you lead us in the uh, pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please join us as we uh, share together and repeat together the mission statement of Del Mar College. Del Mar College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. And as a reminder, Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. And just a friendly reminder to be sure that you silence, uh, either turn off or silence, put on vibrate your phones or any other electronic devices. And uh, we will begin with recognitions. And I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Lewis up first. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce you again to uh, Dr. Leonard Rivera, Dean of Continuing Education and Off-Campus Programs. On March 29th, he received the I Achieve Post-Secondary Advocacy Award from the Corpus Christi Independent School District. The award recognized him for working closely with schools, primarily South Park and Cunningham Middle Schools, through the Parent Academy, DMC campus visits, and completion of adult basic education. Seventh grader Francisco Alonz Ma I'm sorry, Alanis Mata presented Dr. Rivera with the award. This is actually the second time that Dr. Rivera has been recognized with the I Achieve Award. In March 2013, he earned CCISD's Role Model and Volunteerism Award for his leadership and initiative for the Parent Academy Ambassadors for Higher Education. And another recent accomplishment is Dr. Rivera's graduation from the 2017 Hispanic Leadership Program Fellows offered by the National Community College Hispanic Council affiliated with the American Association of Community Colleges. Dr. Rivera was one of 22 Hispanic Community College administrators from across the country. The University of San Diego School of Leadership and Education Sciences hosted the one-year program of intensive studies and mentorship by national experts in community college leadership. Please join me in thanking Dr. Rivera for everything he does for Del Mar College. Well, certainly thank you so much for the opportunity to serve this uh, beautiful campus and college uh, and community. Uh, certainly I can't do it without a great team, great leader, Dr. Scamilla. Thank you so much for all the support, Dr. Lewis uh, and uh, Dr. Silva and uh, many other staff that are working there alongside me and in front of me to uh, make what we do uh, every day a realization uh, for our community at large. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to working with you all certainly in the current and future. Thank you. And if I could have Rob Meilenberg and uh, Scott Beckett and all of the Foghorn students come join me please. Student journalists with the Foghorn Student Newspaper have reached a new level of national recognition this semester. The Foghorn was named a pacemaker finalist for overall excellence from the Associated Collegiate Press Association and a pinnacle finalist for overall excellence from the Collegiate Media Advisors Organization. And according to Rob Meilenberg, their faculty member, these are the two main student publication organizations in the country. The Pacemaker Award has been described as the Pulitzer of student journalism. Now this team is going to have to wait until October to find out if they won overall excellence number one in these two uh, national uh, competitions, but actually my money is on you guys. I think you're doing a marvelous job. Um, 
On a statewide level, Foghorn members brought home accolades from the recent Texas Intercollegiate Press Association Conference, and that's comprised of 60 colleges statewide. Editor-in-Chief Mark Young, you know, okay. Uh, he won two awards on site, including first place in news writing, and while he was there, he accepted 40 4 uh, awards earned by the Foghorn in last year's competition. So uh, his car was kind of kind of weighed down when he got home. Uh, managing editor Juliet Hernandez and photo editor Jocelyn Obregon took second place in the two-person photo essay competition. Uh, while Obregon swept the Spanish news writing category. So we were, in, we were represented in a lot of places. Collegiate high school student Mia Estrada, who's not with us, I don't believe, because she's juggling college courses and high school courses at the same time, and the high school folks wanted her to be in class. I don't know what they were thinking. But uh, she was named two-year reporter of the year for her work in reporting, editing, photography, and design. Not bad for somebody who's still in high school. Staff member Emily Hasso won for editorial cartoon design and television advertising. Jonathan Garcia brought home t three awards. Miguel Clement, Clement and Charlie Blaylock each earned two awards for contests that were conducted during the conference. So these guys deserve at least two rounds of applause for national and for state recognition. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I mean, it's what's really nice is I get to see you guys every time about this time of year because the consistency and the quality of the students that are coming through this program. But, I, and I've always tried to, I've always said openly that Del Mar College has one of the best two-year journalism programs in the country. And we've had some awards to back this up, but these students are the ones who really achieve that. So I am one of those very fortunate people who get to go to work every day and work with this group. I did want to, oh, he's right there. I did want to mention Scott Beckett, too, because a lot of the consistency and the quality is really coming from kind of a balance. He advises the newspaper with me, and he was named Texas Intercollegiate Press Association Advisor of the Year. So he needs another round of applause for that. The last thing I want to say is when I go to these conferences every year, I have conversations with advisors from all campuses across Texas, and I know them all very well. I am very fortunate to work with the administration we work with here and to have the support and the openness we have always had. So thank you all very much. Rob, you stole my conclusion, but mm -hmm. Scott. <laughs> Scott, thank you for all you do as well. Um, I'd also like the college relations team that's here to just stand. They've, they've threatened me if I actually name them by name, so we're going to do this as a group. Uh, it's also my pleasure to announce that the college relations team earned four national and five regional professional awards this spring. The National Council for Marketing and Public Relations awarded our Industrial Trades Television ad the Gold Award at the National Conference recently, first place. Also, two silver awards for radio ads highlighting both our industrial trades programs and our natural sciences programs. And a bronze award for the design graphics of the Viking Go mobile app. Not the workings of the app, but the, the graphic design, the way it looks. So uh, four national awards. And uh, if that wasn't enough, we also brought home from District 5 of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. Um, five uh, awards at that conference. The Gold Award for our public service radio announcement, again for industrial education. A Silver Award for our radio public service announcement in the It Takes a Viking campaign. Uh, our It Takes a Viking campaign television series also took the Silver Award. In the radio category, the team earned a Bronze Award and an honorable mention for two other Viking PSA spots. And one final accolade that uh, we just found out about last week, Texas uh, Del Mar College's Twitter presence was named number one in the state by the Texas Social Media Research Institute. This first place Twitter award for Texas community colleges is based on the number of Twitter followers we have and our social media influencer score. 
And if you want me to explain that social media influencer score, there'll be a class upstairs later this afternoon because it's a little com complicated. But anyway, I just want to say I'm really proud of our team, even though they don't want to be singled out because they do so much that is interwoven from one staff member to the other. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Claudia Thank you. and team. We're going to move into staff reports and begin with an update on Civitas. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Rito Silva to uh, introduce that. Good afternoon, Board of Regents. Uh, with me is Lauren Hammonds. Lauren is a uh, senior partner and success consultant with Civitas. Lauren has been our partner since the very beginning. Uh, Del Mar College joined the Civitas family December 1st, 2016. There you go. Is that a little bit better? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, as I was saying, Del Mar College joined the Civitas family December 1st, 2016. So we're about 15 months into our relationship. But in that early time, we've had some successes that we want to talk about today. And I tell you, Lauren and Civitas has been absolutely wonderful um, uh, with Del Mar College, or for Del, Del Mar College. Lauren's going to go ahead and start by giving us a little bit of overview of what Civitas has to offer, including the Illum. Uh, platform that we use and she's also talk a little bit about service uh, other programs we're gonna have in the near future so I'll let Lauren start start us off yeah. thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here I always really enjoy being on campus with you I'm excited to tell you a little bit about um, the work that we've been doing um, so um, what you're seeing here is just a um, a diagram that's showing you a little bit of how we're structured. The Students Insight Engine is um, what all of our applications sit on top of. That's the um, that's where we bring in your uh, learning management system data, your student information system data, and build the models that supply the uh, student level persistence prediction that you're seeing in the other applications. Um, Alum Students is an application that you have now, and that's what's um, helped. Um, really precisely identify some of the students that we have um, uh, run campaigns on and uh, some of the initiatives that you're doing um, that uh, Dr. Silva will tell you about. Um, you also have, uh, along with Illum students, um, an application called Impact um, that will allow you to analyze um, programs and initiatives and have a better understanding of what the impact of persistence is, not only for the program, but for which students are most um, impacted by those programs. Um, in addition to that, you have um, Inspire for Advisors is um, a, about to be in your hands. We're in the final stages of validation. The next step that will happen with that is training um, for the team, and we will get that launched. Um, that application then takes that predictive insight and puts it in the hands of your frontline users in a way that makes sense for the, the way that you would be working with a student in an um, advisor capacity. And um, College Scheduler is also uh, forthcoming. And that allows your students to plan their schedules around their life, their work schedules, um, if they've got childcare needs that they need to accommodate for, so they can really maximize um, their ability to get through their programs quickly because they're able to really effectively organize their schedule around their needs. All right, and we'll talk a little bit um, about Alum. Um, this is your command center for student success. So this really allows you to personalize your student's experience um, and identify at-risk students with precision and accuracy so that you can deliver the right message to the right student at the right time. And um, that's the, the link to your um, application right at the bottom, but we're gonna show you a few of the visual representations of your data in this application. Um, this is the home screen. What this allows you to do is filter to um, a given student group that you would be interested in understanding more about and uh, precisely identifying. Um, you could um, take a look at your first time in college students that are within the first year. There's um, any variety of that. The other data points that you see on this screen, um, the persistence prediction, the distribution of those student <coughs> level persistence scores. Um, through very low, low, moderate, high, and very high, and then underneath that, the powerful predictors that are most predictive for that student group all dynamically um, updates depending on the student group that you're filtered to. So you're always looking at um, what is most statistically significant for the student group that you're looking at and how those particular students are um, distributed among those persistent scores. 
the powerful predictors and features that are in a loom are represented in charts like this that allow you to see um, of the historical data that we have of your students and a loom students. Um, this particular chart is showing uh, cumulative GPA and the red line is showing 100% of your historical students that uh, did not persist into the next term. And the green line is showing 100% of your students that did persist into the next term. So that as we're trying to understand the patterns um, of, for your students, it is always based on your students' historical data. Um, so an interesting thing that, um, that we could learn from this chart is uh, we could actually isolate the students that have a 3.0 and above. And then we could um, connect directly to a student list and what that then gives you the ability to do is really precisely target students that are achieving, um, high achieving academically at your institution, but potentially have lower persistence scores for other reasons. There's a lot of things that happen in a student's life that could, um, that could be impacting um, their ability to continue on to the next term. We can precisely identify those students, and I can't see the numbers, Directly from here, so uh, there's um, about 1,500 students that have scores that are very low, low, and moderate. We could then target those students for a really um, precise communication on um, mindset that's going to help them understand um, the benefits to them, give them agency on um, completing their degree here at Del Mar before they move on to their next steps in their career or in another program. And we've had uh, several trainings. I always really enjoy being on campus with your team. We've done a training on March 24th of 2017, April 10th in 2018. We did another training today. The next training coming up will be um, the Inspire for Advisors training. And um, we're also planning a uh, webinar remote training um, for some of your um, team members that are newer to using the tool so we can have some additional time to really um, get in and understand that. How do you go about identifying those at-risk students? You said 1,500 students. What, what method do you use to identify them? That's a great question. The, um, the student um, insights platform that has taken in all of your LMS data and your SIS data, so that's who a student is and what a student's doing, all of the data that we're able to collect um, from there is compared to the students that are here today. So those students are grouped, models are built on top of those clusters, mm -hmm. and that's where we're able to get that uh, student level persistence prediction. It's a very basic explanation. Dave Kill, our chief data scientist, would do a, a much deeper dive on that with you, um, if that's something that you're interested in hearing. But it's um, all based on your historical data. I think the, the thing about this, uh, Regent Rivas, is that we're talking about data that's real time. This isn't kind of after the fact data. This is in mid-semester where you're able to pull these analytics, pull these data, um, and the set of circumstances around these individuals that, that allow us to predict um, what their paths are and do something in midstream. And this is what's so powerful. And so our next step, I don't know, is Craig Brashear is here? Craig, back there, he's our faculty council officer. We were talking about this the other day, about this tool, and he was in our meeting um, getting, you know, when I was talking about this, that we're able to, uh, reach out to put these tools in our faculty and staff <coughs> staff members hands where they can reach our students in midstream um, it's, it's it is a it is already having a profound effect our next step is to get it in our faculty's hands and Craig I promised you it was coming so it's it's coming um, I can't see you but I know you're back there um, we had that training this morning which, which was phenomenal and it is these nudge campaigns that I know I'm talking way too early but I get really excited about this program because I just want to say that you have to be invited to come to this table and, and participate in this, with this application, and I'm just very proud of it. Before we go on, a couple of questions maybe for you, Lauren. <clears throat> on, uh, I'm, I'm gathering the data you showed us why some of it was blanked out is real data, and those graphs were ours and everything else, right? So those are lifted from our data set, correct? correct. Okay. And then if you could roll back just to the very beginning slide where you had the, the boxes of the, uh, one more, I think it is, one more. There you go. Um, a loom is the one that's currently being used now, and then the other three are the ones that we're in the process of rolling out. Is that correct? That's correct. Inspire the next one would be uh, Inspire for Advisors. 
-hmm. That's what Lauren was talking about. We expect that in the next few months. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're probably talking about some summer training going on for that. Correct. And then college scheduler, we'll probably want to have that ready for spring 19. And that just allows the student to pick their schedule. So the students can say, I need to pick up my child from three to five or, or do something. They can block out the schedule, enter the classes they want, and it'll give them multiple combinations that they can select from. So those are not necessarily in the order, but if we were to stack them in the order, the Loom is in process now, Inspire would be next, then College Scheduler Spring of, of next year, uh, this time next year, and then Degree Map, when would that come on? We actually were discussing that uh, th this morning. We we're very anxious to get Degree Maps. It is, I, I would say, Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, probably the most popular program in Civitas. Um, it allows for students to plan out their degree two, three, four years out. Um, so we, uh, we are in line for degree maps mm -hmm. and we're working with Civitas mm -hmm. when they're, uh, able, again, you have to be invited. So when they have an opening, we're ready to, to get into right. that. They're, 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 they're hoppers full of clients <laughs> right they now. Are, That's really are. what's so happening. This is now a, a granular question about uh, degree map. Having just participated in a year long study group with the Higher Education Coordinating Board about uh, financial literacy as a roadblock for, for the you know, 60 by 30 plan. There was a, there's a lot of information out there about for students to model for the type of degrees they have compared to what their uh, debt they're taking on and their potential income from that. Do you have anything built into uh, like that into the degree map? or is So they'll be able to see not just I'm getting this degree, but if I choose this degree, here's my financial outcome when I come out. Yes, and sir. the kind of debt I would be expecting. Great. Um, we are connected to um, Burning Glass um, that's pulling in real-time data um, that students can search not only um, regionally but nationwide depending on what their goals are and where they want to be that would supply um, information about salary for um, any given career. That so they a student explore. in degree map would be able to get all that seamlessly, not have to Correct. go to, uh, to me that's really big because we talk about all the hot topics today with student debt, completion and things like that. Um, and, and picking the wrong degree mm -hmm. and or taking on too much debt relative to the degree, degree that you're going to have. We agree. In addition, um, Degree Map will connect with college schedulers so the student can go from exploring um, careers, exploring degrees, to planning that degree, to planning their schedule, to registration, and it will be a seamless process. Is it anticipated that Degree Map might come online with college scheduler? Because aren't those sort of linked together? They're, 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 they will be linked. So, um, so when theory, you have it, they will be linked. In theory, those middle two boxes w would probably be spring yes. next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. I have a question, Mr. Silva, Yes, right here. Yes. I know we're already addressing the needs of our at-risk students, and I know Lauren mentioned the High Achievers 3.1 mm -hmm. uh, GPA and above. What are we doing with those students? With the Once we identify the High Achievers, the 3.1. Well, th right now we have, and we're gonna talk about it, we have three programs that we're doing right now that we call nudge campaigns right, right now. And so okay. we're, we're basically beginning our relationship with Civitas with some nudge campaigns. <coughs> but for just for retention, we do have retention case managers that talk to students who are on probation academically, and they are brought in and they <coughs> do they, they work with a session okay. on how to get that uh, done. But but I'm not referring to the students that are on probation. I'm referring to the ones that you mentioned, Lauren, the 3.1 and above uh, high achievers. Yeah, the a nudge campaign. So the way um, the way that we think about um, a nudge campaign and how that could be useful with those students is. Um, Knowing that a student is at risk early in the term gives us an opportunity to message with those students over a term so we can look at the pivotal points in a term that we could um, send them messages using um, positive messaging, mindset theory. Um, we can reach out to those students that we know are at risk with the high GPA with the messages that say um, let them know. Um, give them the agency of the benefit of completing their degree sure. um, and and messages like we know that um, college can be difficult for all students even students that are achieving high grades these are some things we've heard from our students that um, mm -hmm. can get in the way and so time those out over the term so that we can help change their behavior and their decision making before that student has decided to this positive out. reinforcement is what I'm hearing. Yes. Regent Stry, as a matter of fact, one of the ones of the nudge campaigns are still we haven't really utilized it yet. But says we're proud of you, and mm -hmm. talks about you know this is what you're doing, and we can be of assistance. Here are some resources. So uh, Civitas has just recently has a nudge uh, hub, mm -hmm. what they call it, and we we just had, we came from a summit last week 
of, from okay. Civic Council. So sure. we're learning all these things as well. And uh, so those are all programs we plan to take advantage of. Thank you. And we were actually in this great uh, time yes. talking about nudge campaigns. Perfect segue, yes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I could add any, uh, any more to that, um, but we are um, tying back these uh, targeted student groups with a data-informed insight from Illum to drive how we are targeting that message over a period of time for that uh, given group of students with the intention to impact their persistence. Sure, and what research tells us is that nudge campaigns can be really effective if a student receives a nudge campaign for somebody they trust mm -hmm. at the college, they are more apt to open it and take action on that. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to take advantage of that nudge campaigns. Um, just this morning, we're learning <coughs> the research that Civic has already done mm -hmm. is that students open their emails 80% of the time. Some of the new, uh, one of the new analysis that they have on there that we're gonna take advantage of is to be able to see who opened their emails. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to, to do that. And then we'll be able to follow up and see the actions that they've been taking as well. So again, that's something that is new to Illum, that they, um, I forgot the, the or what's it called, the, the tab that you have on there? Uh, just on there. Uh, outreach. Outreach. Uh, outreach tab mm -hmm. on there that allows us to outreach to students with mm -hmm. nudge campaigns. So, but we have done some work with nudge campaigns. One of the programs we did is our Operation Graduation. We had a nudge campaign for, a civ for graduation, and this was part of our Title V grant that talks about completion. So we work with students who are 75% complete with their programs. Uh, Regent Estrada, you're asking what do you do with those students who we think are really fine. Traditionally, we think students are that far along, just let them be and they'll find their way because they've gotten to this point already. But that's not always the case. Is sometimes even those students need a little bit of nudge. So what we did is we looked at students who are 75% complete and we found there's almost 3,000 of them. Well, it's hard, we have three graduation coaches part of our Title V campaign. That's a big caseload. So what we did using Illum through Civitas is those students who are predicted to be high persistence, we just send them an email and said, here's the application. Our records indicate you are close to graduation. If you need something, give us a call. Those who had moderate persistence rates, we send them an email and we invited them to the graduation uh, uh, workshops. And that's what you see in front of you is come over to our workshops and we'll help you fill out your graduation form and you'll be able to talk to a graduation coach. Those who had low persistence rates, we contacted them and asked them for a one-to-one -one meeting so we could go over your degree plan. And talking to the graduation coaches, they said that was really effective. We found out at the time the students were having 80, 90 hours and they sat down and talked to them. So not only can you, you, know, you have a degree, you have a certificate on top of that. And so it really was really effective. So the results of that graduation com campaign from 16, 17, it actually increased our um, applications by 26% and our graduations by 31% for graduation applicants. So raw numbers, and I just had some raw numbers I ran. So like in 2016, we had 549 graduates. We increased that to 747 graduates uh, with this uh, program. So that was last year. So the next question is, can you sustain that? Well, last year we had 884 applicants, which is a huge increase. This year we have 846 graduates. So we have been able to sustain that. Now, of course, we won't know how many of those actual graduates till the end of the semester, <coughs> and we'll find, find out how many are graduates. But last year we did have our largest graduation class. And like Dr. Escamilla said at the training, he joined us at the training this morning, is we don't believe that's, all, that's by accident. Uh, it was really some intentional work that went into that. So the, uh, the graduation program is one of the nudge campaigns that we currently have. We also have a Men of Color initiative that started in the fall, and uh, Dean Sanders and Dr. Ortega led this uh, effort with the Student uh, Engagement and Retention Office. And they were sending out nudges to the Men of Colors and just saying, you know, these are resources available, these are programs that are coming up. They had 27 nudges that happened in the fall. Actually, the organizations called the Viking Fellows came out of this nudge campaign. In the spring of 2018, they had 25 nudges going out. Now, we still need to do some analysis with it, and we're working with Civitas and Lorraine on getting some of that. Mm -hmm. But again, this is, a, uh, again, another nudge campaign that the college is embarking on. Let me volunteer to help you on that and tell you the reason why. Uh, I headed the civil rights movement in this uh, community years ago. Mm -hmm. I played a lot of basketball over on Northside. Mm -hmm. I raised my sons playing basketball over there. 
So uh, have the ability to communicate with these guys and nudge them forward. Sure. Uh, and any way that I can help, uh, please let me know. Uh, in fact, I will tell you that I've just finished all my work for the South Side uh, Community Leadership. Uh, uh, I'm ready to go into another project. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this would be a great project. Sure. So let me know if I can help. Sure. Thank you, Regent Watts. And when we know also by research is that uh, this population is phenomenal. It's just not completing school. And it's a, it's, it's a huge issue nationally. And so, of, of course, here. Yeah, so we're going to pay extra attention to that as well. Uh, I know Dr. Escamilla is also on a board uh, with the uh, Project Mails program. So this with Project Mails program is going to go really, it, really it's a, well. Talk about the partnership with the University of Texas, if you would. Sure. That's sure. where it comes from. Yeah, the University of Texas has a Project Mails program led by um, uh, Dr. Victor Sainz. And it's a statewide program, and it is very much focused on research on what are the best practices that are helping men of color uh, not just enter college but finish school. And so this, uh, uh, this program, they'll, they'll come out to your school and they'll review the, for the programs that you have. And then they also have us send students to Austin in August for a summit that, that they have on there. Yep. I uh, should have added, I did my master's thesis on Northside, so I've been to every house on Northside. So you know it well. So I'm very comfortable uh, block walking, so to speak, uh, over there going after these guys. So uh, please let me know how I can help. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. Dr. Victor Sines is the department chair for the, the College of Education's uh, Educational Leadership and Policy uh, Department, formerly the Educational Administration Department there. So. He's a great friend of ours. We're glad to be a part of it. Absolutely. It's been another wonderful partnership. And then the Enrollment Center, this is the last, uh, last nudge campaign I share with you. But they're also sending out emails to certain students, trying to get them to re-register. So they're targeting students who are the 2.0, less than 24 hours. They're also looking at dual credit students um, and students who have just not, not returned. And uh, sorry, there's another one here. Okay. And uh, so those are just some of the examples of nudge campaigns that we're using. Explain the acronyms up there, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry that we target liberal arts students with less than 2.0, and then liberal arts students with over 40 hours, and uh, dual credit completers and those who have finished dual credit. If they're coming back in the fall and the spring, that's an analysis that we're working with Civitas to to look at as well. And then a sp uh, spring 2017 students who are not registered, contacting them saying, "We noticed that you came last year. You're not registered. Is there something we can do to help you register?" And then we have uh, workshops in our enrollment center that helps them with registration and with financial aid as well. And so those are the nudges that we keep on sending out, asking them to, to re return. What, what students are being targeted? All of them that haven't re-registered or just certain Well, percentage? yeah, all the ones who have not registered, like the very last bullet. So the students who were here in the spring but didn't return, we, we kind of uh, target them and saying, you know, is there anything that we can do to get you to come back to school? And uh, so sometimes we get answers, sometimes they come back, and sometimes they, they'll email saying, I've moved on to... XYZ University. My stepdaughter has missed three semesters now and nobody's ever contacted her. Yeah. She wants to come back. Yeah. Probably in the fall, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to. <coughs> yeah. Dr. Silva. Yes, sir. Uh, once they're getting close to graduation and they have told you that they want to proceed with their education, uh, does the nudge campaign say okay if you're looking at a university this is the time for you to be doing that or you need to do such and such in order to go on or if you're going in the workforce do is that going to eventually happen i know i'm getting ahead of myself there but what goes on the nudge campaign is a tool that we use to get that our graduation coaches they do financial literacy planning as well they assist them with either transferring to university but they also have career awareness so they all, they, they'll connect them with, today you saw we have a, a job fair right. going on today. So uh, part of the component of the Viking Connection grant is to get them gr graduated and either transfer or into the, the job market. Thank you. Dr. S did you, Carol, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, please. I have two questions, actually. Um, so these strategies and tactics that you're, that you're describing make a lot of sense and, and are exactly what we want staff to be doing. So my question, and I'm not sure if it's for you or for Dr. Escamilla, where, how does this fit into what the board has been asking for in terms of overall annual objectives and the reporting on whether or not we're meeting those objectives? Because as a board, we are looking at uh, recruitment, enrollment, uh, persistence, completion. 
So, so those big indicators are what we need to be looking at as sure. a board and making sure that you have the resources like this to, to, to accomplish those things. So what's yeah. the next step for us to get to that point where we have the annual objectives and know whether or not the strategies and tactics that you're describing today are helping us meet those annual objectives? Before you answer that, because that was exactly my question, <clears throat> to frame it in, a, in same purpose as Carol, but, but maybe in a little different way, a nudge campaign is a tactic based upon a need, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. We're asking, and we've been asking for quite a while, we want to see as a board goals uh, and targets and dashboards. And we know that Civitas, I mean, that's why we supported mm -hmm. the administration going into this. We know the data is there. So what we're, I, t to me, what we need to hear, not necessarily completely today, but this is great. The next step is, okay. Integration. What, yeah, what's what's the strategy, what, what are the targets, the goals, some sort of dashboard, let's work to go to the board. That's ultimately what we have responsibility for. From every conference we've gone to, they're asking us student success, student success, student success. So I'm just echoing what Carol's saying. Okay. And then I think yeah. Sandra would say, and those that were just at the GLI Institute, Government Leadership Institute, that's the hottest topic, so. So the integration is the next step. And so we're, as we roll out, and, and where the full integration of this program, where we really begin to get the deepest effect is when the faculty get this in their hands. And when we push this out and get this out to them in their hands, and we have it widespread, not just at the, at the uh, Illum level, but when we have it at the advisor's level and in the faculty's hands is when we will have that full effect. And that is not to say that we do not begin the integration of these strategies into our uh, or these tactics into our strategy of the, of the strategic plan. That is what we, what's what begins, that's what comes next. So we're gonna do things, we're gonna have to do things kind of at the same time because we can't, we, we'll begin the integration here in the next, uh, as we write our next strategic plan and prepare for all that, which is all coming upon, coming upon us here in the next few months, we bring the Civitas um, um, factor in and, and then begin to write out those, those goals with, those, with this, uh, this capa with these capabilities in our hands. So that's next. Sure. But, and, but, and but, but, but so it's an integration plan that's going to have to happen in mid and it's going to have to happen at the same time as we're pushing it further into the college. And having Civitas as a partner really helps out because they have data scientists that will help us with the analysis of this. And, but and, and probably other institutions that have already created dashboards and know what key indicators are and what we should be looking at and things like that. I hope what you're not saying, Dr. Eskimi, is we're going to wait till the next strategic plan is done to come up with a dashboard. No, that's not what yeah, I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying it's going to be done at the same time, right, okay. and it's going to be done at the, as we're pushing it out. As we're pushing it out, we're integrating at yeah. the same time. I mean, I get that. Th what's great about these nudge campaigns is we're able to stick our toe in the water, and we're showing success. <laughs> and it's it's probably convincing people on campus that this is good because there's nothing worse than a new software du jour, and you're trying to explain to people this is really going to be good. Trust us, right? So I'm all for that. But we've been talking about this for years, so we we need to advance it. Okay. And my other question is related to the student profiles. Do we have, does Civitas have as part of this an understanding of what the individual student goals are? So if a student is starting here, never intending to graduate from Del Mar College, but is intending to come here and get their first year under their belt and transfer somewhere else, then helping that student achieve their personal goals even if the state doesn't count it as a success, we want to count it as a success, and we want to begin to understand individual student goals. If a student goal is merely to learn Spanish and to take four courses in Spanish so they can take a uh, long planned trip to Spain for a year, then that student has accomplished their goals, whether as, as an 80-year-old or whatever. So does Civitas have a place for the student to articulate within some categories what their personal goals are? If you are capturing that in your student information system, our data science team can work to understand what the implications of that are on your models and include that data um, as, a, as it does have implication. So. Okay, so that's not a Civitas question. That would be a, what's our student enrollment software? Datatel or Illusion. Okay. And, and then we're looking for an ERP and that may be something I, we consider when we look for an ERP. But in addition, I, I did, um, Lauren just gave us a, a kind of a review of Inspire for Advisors mm -hmm. this morning. It's the first time we kind of really looked into insights of it. It does have a component where the inspire, when the student advisor meets with a student one on one, they could write notes in their uh, uh, in in their 
personal profile, profile yeah. being able to say the student intends to just get some computer skills mm -hmm. and get it back out to the job market. One of the because one of the things that we've struggled with at a state level is is helping the higher education coordinating board mm -hmm. uh, in their first time uh, first year in college cohort that they tend to want to grade <coughs> us on is not an appropriate cohort for a community college because our students are so dramatically different. So if we can come up either as a college or as a group of community colleges across the state, the, the data points that are actually meaningful in our world, mm -hmm. I think that would be extremely helpful. So can, I don't know where the, the, a consortium is on community colleges discussing <coughs> this, but I certainly would not oppose Del Mar College leading that discussion because so I feel very strongly that what we're required to report to the state is not an accurate picture of our, our potential yeah. for student success. You're, you're singing my song, and I so agree with you. Uh, but the, on the other, And on the other side, there are the success points um, that we can break down and begin to measure. And those are the things, those are the awards that really students happen to kind of, in many cases, happen to stumble on by way of their, their, their time here. They don't, many times they go and they don't realize that they're actually earning these these lower these these certificates with certain numbers of smaller hours and so forth so that's that's the um, that's part of the integration that we would look at in terms of the s those, those uh, milestones those smaller milestones that are already built out there for funding mm -hmm. and unfortunately that's why they're built out there so that we can measure them and fund off of and then still there's a nuanced piece that you're talking about that says well how are we engaging our students and how are we really discerning their um, the reason for being here and so that that gets trickier and I don't think we have a, a, a mechanism for that uh, electronically yeah, I I mean electro I yeah and I could not uh, agree with Regent Scott more in a community college we have so many exit points exactly. you know if a, a student comes over and gets some basic computer skills they only need to get in the workforce right away because of personal reasons they come in and they do that you know we see it as success but sometimes the state would see it well you didn't retain that student didn't graduate mm -hmm. that student but the, the reality is there, I, and this is very simple, but in a drop-down menu, I bet there's a dozen key reasons that a student would determine their time here at Del Mar College is a success. Mm -hmm. And there might, be, there might be then another several dozen uh, one-offs. But I'll bet we can come up with 80 or 85 percent of the reasons within 12 or 15 categories of why a student comes to Del Mar College and what they will determine their, their time here to be successful. And, and let's start capturing some of that. Maybe there's half a dozen. I don't know how many there are, but, but let's, why can't we start capturing that information uh, to the extent that we can and begin to talk about how students define success, not how the state of Texas defines success. We still have, we can't ignore the state of Texas, oh. but we can also begin to talk about how we are fulfilling what our students tell us their goals are. That's powerful information to have and can drive the conversation at the state level if we have the data. I agree with Carolyn. In addition, I just even think making the students identify their reason is, has some value in it. I mean, that some of them may not know yep. until they're asked. On the same topic, are we only yeah. identifying credit students? What about continuing education students? At this point, with Civitas here, we're only doing credit, credit. at this okay. point. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you have the student that <coughs> wants to learn how to play the piano because they didn't quite get it when they were here, or they want to do that on the side so they can get a second job, yeah. and so take a music class and do probably two years' worth of piano, and that, that enrichment class should have a separate... It, you know category in uh, what we're doing because they want to get better or they want it for a second and then we probably have some older adults that never got to play the piano and will come back and take private lessons and I don't know if we count the individual private lessons not the class as being an enrichment course Dr. Silva yes, sir. Yeah, there's uh, two or three different scenarios I'm sorry right go ahead okay I don't know if you're prepared to answer this today, but uh, you mentioned advisors. Can you give me a guesstimate as to how many students are assigned to each advisor here on campus? Well, we have a faculty advising model, so the faculty serves as advisors here, so it all depends on the different majors. We do have liberal arts uh, advisors for the general undecided uh, uh -huh. students, so it, it all depends on uh, the different programs. And the case notes for but it's advisors. the faculty who's doing the yes, advising. Yes, oh, okay. Advising model. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And I think, in, is there any other questions? 
our expectations are way up there, so keep up the good work. <laughs> Lauren, don't be intimidated by our, our <laughs> verisimilous, I can't even say the world today, but all of our questions. We're excited about this, and we've been wanting this, and, and we're just wanting to keep moving along, and so thank you for all that you're doing to help our team and our students. You're welcome. Thank you for including me in this conversation. It's great yeah. to be able to, um, as always, hear the, the thoughtful way that you support your students here. And I'm sure the, the Del Mar team and I know the Regents would say to you, as you're out there working and your folks are working with other colleges, when you see things they're doing we should be doing, please tell us. <laughs> well, good ideas, because we, we want it all. Well, actually, we spend a lot of time broadcasting what you're doing to our other partners, which uh, brings us to um, uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> uh, brings us to um, our our we we are so celebrate all of your achievements um, with you um, back in the Austin office. Um, it is uh, we ring a bell. It's a big deal um, when you have uh, completed campaigns. When we know the outcomes of your campaigns, and um, we're really excited to. Um, to help amplify any time we know that um, the public is also talking about what you did do. So our marketing team um, put together just a couple of um, uh, pictures for you that capture some of the um, press that you've had. And the picture down here at the bottom of this one in particular is uh, one of those times we rang the bell for um, for the um, near completers campaign. And um, I know it's difficult to see, so um, we can yeah, pass them around. Um, but there's uh, our team travels quite a lot. But in this picture is our um, CEO, one of our founders. We're all wearing uh, paper Viking hats um, to to celebrate with you. And so we're really um, proud of your successes and and just um, really uh, honored to be a part, um, a small part of uh, what you do for your students. And um, our next community insight report where we take these learnings that we have with our partners and then take a look across the data set with all of our, um, all of partners in the Civitas um, is actually gonna be centered around um, your near graduation campaign. Um, that was a really exciting campaign and new learning. So we went and looked in all of our other, um, uh, in the data set that we have across the partnership and found that there's some really important insights that need to be shared with all of our partners. And so, um, so Thank you for that question, and, and you guys are often the example that we're sharing elsewhere. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to invite Dr. Beth Lewis and Lauren White for They're going to give us an update on the uh, Del Mar College Police Department. Thank you. We have four areas that we want to discuss as we transition from a security office to a police department. Chief White's going to be talking about our current state of security, I'll talk a little bit about what's been completed so far and what remains to be done by September 1st of this year, and then Chief White will finish by talking about what remains to be done by September 1st of 2019. So good afternoon. Um, right now, uh, our security consists of employing off-duty CCPD officers. That's two officers per campus, east and west from 7.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. on Thursday, Monday through Thursday. And then on Friday, we have them here from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, the ones that are on East Campus also cover the Center for Economic Development, and the ones on West Campus will go out and check the Northwest Center from time to time, along with the airport when needed. Um, we also have a contract with um, Allied Universal Security Company. We average about 1,050 hours per week um, involving about 26 different officers on campus, and that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days for the year. Um, most of our interactions are calls for service. That's escorts, lost items, directions. And um, then most of our criminal activity that occurs on campus is Class C misdemeanors. And what do I mean by that? It's um, uh, minor crimes. Um, and for the most part, we end up making uh, most of our arrests are usually for someone under the influence of alcohol. So what we've done so far is that we've revised part of the first floor of White Library to create a police department public space and a secured space. That includes an evidence locker, which is required by TCOL. We have a budget line established. We have received approval from DMC's um, insurance company to have a police department. We've met with purchasing to discuss procurement for uniforms, vehicles, and equipment. 
We're working with the College Relations Office for the design of the badges and the patches. We have been working with IT. I neglected to put that on our PowerPoint uh, to establish a records management computer-aided dispatch system. So what remains to be done by September 1st of this year is we have to complete a rank structure. We need to complete the procedures manual, and Chief White has been uh, consulting with the police chiefs from College of the Mainland, Alvin Community College, Brazosport College, and Austin Community College for examples. Everyone has been very welcoming and very open with their materials, and we're very grateful for that. We'll be bringing forward a um, formal proposal for the police department approval by the Board of Regents, and we'll be doing that within the next two months. We'll be submitting the police department application to T. Cole, and we'll be finishing out the dispatch area. What is T. Cole? It is the Texas the Commission Texas. on Law yeah. Enforcement. It used to be T. Cleos, right? Yeah, Cleos. Yeah, it used to be T. Cleos. Yeah. So, are, we um, using, are we using the same security company that we've had for a while, or is that a new company? This one has been um, since. 2015 is when the contract um, was uh, renewed. renewed or and the company has changed it was um, originally um, allied allied Barton and um, Universal joined together so now it's actually allied Universal um, so at one time it was just Universal um, and then Allied Barton purchased them in the ensuing years and became a con conglomerate of the two. Are they doing a good job? Yes, sir. I think so. Let, let me ask, would, I had a uh, long discussion, uh, uh, a lot of questions Friday with the su superintendent out at uh, Cal Allen, I hadn't finished school yet, exactly on uh, what you uh, try to protect students from. But uh, issues like uh, locking the classroom do uh, door uh, or securing uh, the hallway uh, doors, uh, what do you all do as far as our campus, which kind of is wide open? Is that a simple question or is it more complex? <laughs> well, I can tell you some of the things that we have recently done with the help of physical facilities, um, and that is um, the locks on all of the classroom doors have been changed um, to push button locks so that if they're inside the classroom and need to secure the door, they no longer have to go out into the hallway and use a key. They can actually just push a button and <laughs> secure the door from the inside. Okay, and then let me ask one more question. Sure. Uh, I work out a lot over, over in the auditorium, and uh, so, uh, you know, the, the gym and the weight room and the racquetball courts, everything else is uh, uh, life, so to speak. But the question is, what is done to protect those uh, kids that are dressed to work out and certainly don't have uh, clothes to put guns in and uh, to protect themselves with? Uh, do you all uh, have cameras in all those facilities? or wh What do you do to protect those kids? To the extent that we can have employee cameras, um, we do employ cameras. Um, there are some areas that by law you cannot have cameras in. Um, dressing rooms are one example. So I am saying as far as the facilities. There are some um, cameras utilized over in that area. Um, the is there a camera in the natatorium? I do not believe there is a camera in actually in the natatorium so itself. The point is that uh, uh, there is a, an open door at one end, there's two open doors at the, at the other end. Anybody with a gun could walk in and uh, I'm going, to I'm going to make this suggestion. We need to be careful about getting into too much detail because you broadcast plans to the public. So, uh, Lauren, if, if this is things you think we shouldn't be talking about publicly, we can certainly reserve it for closed session. That would be a good idea. That would be a better idea. Okay. And it's off topic. And it's off topic, too. So what we need to have completed um, is uh, once the paperwork is filed with TCOL, um, we hope to gain uh, approval from them within four to eight weeks. And speaking to the person who is the only person in the state that goes out and does these inspections, he says four weeks is a possibility, but eight weeks is more likely. So once we turn in the paperwork, hopefully by October, end of October, 1st of November, we would have our approval. 
We want to look at hiring a dispatch records management supervisor and um, the also hire a second in command for the police department. Um, and then we want to make sure that we have our um, patches and badges and all of the things ready to be ordered when we get ready to start hiring officers, which we were looking at hiring um, eight officers in the spring of 19, 2019 and to be fully staffed, um, well not, I take it back, fully staffed was not the word we want to use as we plan for other campuses, um, but to be staffed with around 16 officers by the fall of 2020. I have a question. Is sure. this the only place, the White Library, that has police space or do we have police space at the other campuses also? Specific police space, we do not necessarily have. What we have is security occupies offices. And as we get ready to move forward with more of a police presence versus a um, security company presence, um, we will be able to utilize some of those spaces. But we will be looking for um, some spaces on the other campuses that we'll utilize for law enforcement purposes. But this uh, East Campus will have police space at the White Library. Right now, okay. yes ma'am. Thank you. Yes ma'am. I'm gonna make an assumption, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway, that we uh, coordinate with Metricom, what's it, called? What's it called? The Met yes, Metricom. Metricom. Mm -hmm. So there is an integration with Metricom uh, or there will be in terms of dispatch and response and those kinds of things? Or there will be, <clears throat> right now we're looking at, we would have our own dispatch, but we would coordinate with um, getting a memorandum of understanding with the city of Corpus Christi and uh, relationship to if we needed additional services, um, we need to partner with them because they will be who we would call in an event where we exceed our abilities. But they are also the 911. They call. are, and so yes. they, they would need to be able to communicate to us if there was a 911 call. So yes, that that okay. And that yes, ma'am. But that that's already kind of ongoing. Okay. Now, when they receive a call and it involves security, they call or involves Delmar College. They will usually call our security number and say, "Hey, we've received this call," and they give us a heads up before um, anybody's uh, dispatched necessarily, even over here. Any other questions? questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the third staff report is on the 2014-2016 bond updates, capital improvement projects, uh, August Alfonso. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before I start, I'd like to take this time to introduce uh, Amos uh, Byington. He's from AGCM. He is uh, formally assigned to Delmar College as our project manager for both the 14 and 16 bond. Uh, have <coughs> you note that although he's a project manager, he also is a licensed architect. And along with him is uh, Nathan Sweeney. You've seen Nathan before. He is the vice president of AGCM, and he's managing the entire project for Delmar College on behalf of AGCM. 2014 bond project update. It's been a while since we provide you an update. Uh, these categories that you see on the left are the three existing projects that was funded by a financial draw in 2015 and 2016 to the total of <coughs> 83108206. <million> <coughs> I'm happy to say that Center Plan Phase 1 and Phase 2 was the first project completed for the 2014 bond, and if you notice, it was completed under budget. There is a probability, we hope, we think, it should, uh, com be completed the three main construction project, the ET Expansion, Workforce Development Center, and the General Academic Music Phase Two. the bid were all under budget as well. Uh, this time, we still expect these projects to be completed in time, uh, but there are a lot of discussions as it relates to ET and workforce as it relates to the effect of Hurricane Harvey and the rain in the last uh, few months. And I'll give an update when, when the schedule gets uh, resolved. Other component of the 14 bond actually is the 1.8 million budget for the planning of the Southside campus. 
we have uh, we have done a lot in master planning at Southside campus. Uh, we recently finished the programming with Doug Lowe on the facilities for the Southside campus, and happy to note that we have a very healthy balance on the books in the tune of 977,000 and change. Before uh, August, before you go forward, go back to that slide if you would, please. Mm -hmm. uh, just to be clear, that eight hundred, that 977,000 is related only to that third bullet. There are differences in those other line items. There's also projects in 2014 we haven't covered yet. So the, you're not trying to, I want to make sure people are clear that are watching, that doesn't represent the only amount of difference yet. Yes, correct. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> the next three slides are, are just intended to show you uh, that the construction schedule and the financial draw correspondingly are all positive at this point. Uh, this data is uh, as of April 14. On the construction costs, I got a nudge from one of the contractors, our biggest project, that we have actually, you know, drawn more than what you are, are, are expressing. But actually, uh, as of April 4, these are the financial draw against eBuilder, what we booked on eBuilder based on uh, uh, approved uh, invoices. So uh, in this slide, uh, construction cost, 33% uh, for the workforce development has been paid up. Uh, construction schedule from 0 to 100%, meaning occupancy date, we are at 55% of the schedule. That's all this slide is intended to show. On ET, correspondingly, we have expended or paid up 27% of the construction budget. On the right, on the schedule, we are at 55%. 53% to occupancy date in terms of percentage. General Academic Music Building, $46 million project. This is the biggest project this college had ever had to date. And I'm happy to tell you that this is in the best shape in terms of the three projects, both on schedule and financial draw. Uh, we have paid up invoices to the tune of 18% of the construction cost or budget. And on, sch on schedule from the start date uh, to occupancy date of August 2019, uh, we are at 38% 30 of the schedule. And if you want a one-on-one -on -one update uh, on the construction, uh, go to your left and you can see how prominent these structures are, are getting built up. And I believe it's time to show you a very short a little uh, less than five minute video that showcases the three uh, three projects. Thank you, Brad. This is a rendering of on how this uh, facility is going to look. Uh, this is the uh, view from the fine arts. You recall the English building? <laughs> This is a drone video, of course, of AGCM. And in one minute, you will see <laughs> a total of 159 days of construction of the General Academic Music Building. It's phenomenally uh, good running. You may even witness some snow on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> This is the view from the library. And since we store this in the cloud, we will always have these images forever. This is a different view from the library as well. And this is when you can see how the different structures are getting formed to the left of your screen. 159 days of construction. <laughs> Merging technology, uh, $8.6 million project, signed by GNAC. This is the west entrance view from the northeast. And I want to point out the glass feature, which happened to be the sage glass that you all approved, that's self-dimming. The one feature that ET is going to bring to the West Campus is 
the Student Learning Center. For the first time, the West Campus is going to have tutorial services that predominantly only happens in the East Campus. So this is going to be a traumatic student services enhancement for the West Campus. This is the laydown area before it got touched. And again, in 20 seconds, you will see 159 days of construction. Like I said earlier, both ET and the workforce project got the, uh, s their schedule got affected by Hurricane Harvey. And uh, AGCM and our contractors are in the process of reconciling those schedules. The last project is the Workforce Development Center. It's the entrance. Courtesy of uh, Turner Ramirez. Wonderful two-story design. This is the area in between Flato and the new facility. And if you recall, uh, it was an uh, alternate bid that was funded. So those enhancements will happen. This is how it looked before construction. And of course, the time lapse. It's about a hundred twenty seven days of construction. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> thank you. Let me thank you, uh, August. Yes, yes. Let sir. me take you back to the main uh, campus and a uh, question to the pr president uh, on the what's being uh, uh, constructed right now. As I understand it, there are three buildings that are, are connected. Instead of calling them a music building, academic buildings, what's the possibility, Mr. Uh, uh, president? calling one music building, the other uh, English building, and third sociology building. What's the possibility of that? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we've got the, the monikers that we have on them now were for design purposes. And uh, the function of them I don't have in my mind right now other than it's the general academic um, building music phase two. I, I hear what you're saying. I'll have to take that up with you at a later time. Um, again, the purposes for today were for design and for build Let and for a carrying out. I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. Let me suggest you give some thought to it and, then, uh, and let's put it on the agenda sometime for us to have a discussion about it. The, the other question I had, uh, the old uh, uh, music building that's going to be uh, redone, what is it being redone for? Uh, general classrooms is what it's being done for. So the spaces that would be vacated from there will be used for general academic space. Okay, I, I had uh, walked over and taken a very cl close look at uh, where the uh, collegiate high school is and with, with this question. Uh, what's the, the possibility of uh, moving the student success center over to where the music building is now with the, their own uh, parking lot on theirs. And let's expand that uh, uh, collegiate high school to t uh, two stories in that building. Is that a possibility or, uh, w or have you all discussed it? Not that specifically, not that specifically. Could, could you come back to us then for a discussion on that? Uh, I mean, we could certainly look at it. We need to be posted separately. But I, as I understand it, Dr. Escamilla, 
all that planning was done when we published the bond issue and all the monies allocated are already pretty well laid out, aren't they? To some yes, extent? yes, so and so, you know, moving moving resources from St. Clair and those sorts of things. Um, and St. Clair was already built out with prior bond money and grant money and everything else. Right? Yes, so yes, and that's currently occupied and that's primarily, that's where Collegiate High School is based out of. And remember, the Collegiate High School students go all throughout the campus. They're all over in every one of our buildings. So they're not really in one building with the exception of their principal's office and the administration for that per particular place. So. Um, I'll take it under advisement, but the, but the idea of moving them at this point, um, the thing, what we want to do before we do that, Mr. Watts, and I think you would agree, is we want to make sure that as we know that they already have a footprint here at the college, we want to make sure that our faculty who will remain on this campus, in other words, those that won't move to, uh, to South or others, that they have adequate and complete amount of space necessary to operate. So we have some steps to do to take care of uh, Del Mar College faculty per se first when we do that I think we can consider some other things but first things first we've got to make sure that all of our faculty are in newly renovated state-of-the-art um, um, classrooms like we're building uh, two more quick questions sure. uh, uh, number, number one Did you turn your microphone on Mr. Watts I'm sorry I'm just getting a I'm just getting requests to make sure you get your microphone on so we can be heard could you punch the button number one on, on it's not on. Uh, on the new roofs, all right, does that include uh, above the racquetball courts where, it, oh, thank goodness. All right, then the final question. For people who live in Corpus Christi, east is at Mustang Island, and west is West Campus. We're central part of the city. Why aren't we called Central Campus? So the naming uh, campaign for the entire district is something we'll be proposing at a later date. And, you know, to, to be talking about directional uh, themes at this point versus thematic or things that we have to talk about as a, as, as a college and certainly with as a Board of Regents, that's coming. That's coming. Now, specifically, we don't want to move to change anything just yet because what we'll want to do is address the entire district in a naming campaign. Well, here again, that's another issue. Give some thought to it. And listen well, to I, I, it. and I agree. I agree that, you know, we're east of what? You know, we say that all the time. And east of west. West, west of, you know, west of. We're east of the west bank. campus. The uh, east of the bank. Uh, east, I know. I, I use the term east of, of uh, winter schnitzel. But, <laughs> but we've we got to move away from that. Mr. Watts, Mr. Watts, we've we, we got to move away from that. And that is a bigger theme that we'll address as a college and as a board. And, and maybe it's important for everyone to keep in mind that, <clears throat> The nature of the 2014 bond package had those big projects we've just, we're getting an overview on today, but there's numerous other smaller projects, all built with input from on campus, yes. a master plan based upon programming needs approved by the Board of Regents yes. and then funded in the bond. So yes, the general direction is set, minor tweaks can certainly happen as we go along. But, but uh, And part of why some of these questions may be coming up now is, we're so focused on getting the, th the, the several big buildings out of the ground, there's another six or seven projects, I think, that are coming ahead with various amounts of budgets that we'll be hearing more as we go forward. I'll be yes, talking sir. about that directly. Yeah. If, if we let you get to your presentation. How about that? We'll turn it back over to you. Okay. I'm very excited to show you. This is courtesy of College Relations. Uh, this is how our campus is going to look like once General Academic Music Building is built. This is their campus virtual tour project, so I'm borrowing it for today. And uh, you can actually see how the East Campus is going to look. Uh, could you tell us real quick the Louisiana Parkway design? What have you all decided to do? We have funds uh, that, that can affect that. We have yet to program that. It's not, we haven't addressed it yet. We've only have it partially funded, we think. We'll have to address that and program that. We'll be coming back to the board with that okay. as well. Okay, you come back to us. Okay, real fine. So this is the General Academic Music Building here, okay? Uh, if I go to the West Campus, you can actually see the entire site with workforce already almost looking like it's complete mm -hmm. and the emerging technology building with, with its expansion. So when I saw it the other day, I uh, 
had to ask college relations to allow me to use it today to, to give you a view on how our campuses uh, are going to look after these projects. So that's the end of my 2014 presentation. Uh, talking about uh, the other projects that uh, have yet to be started. Uh, working with AGCM, we, we had a look ahead and we validated past schedules and we came up with this schedule for a very uh, timely but uh, quite aggressive schedule f uh, towards the tail end that uh, this, uh, this is this how we're going to ex execute the rest of the bond. You know, just want to highlight the various renovations all over campus. Uh, the old music renovation, Memorial Classroom uh, renovation, the Heldenfels Harbin Center East Campus signage, the Louisiana Parkway construction, and the White Library. The project that we think uh, can, if uh, we don't adjust the calendar. The last till 2021 will own will be the White Library. It's the biggest project uh, to the tune of 7.6 million, and it also happens to be right next to the existing construction with the general academic music. So we are going to re revalidate the sequencing of this remodeling when we engage with the programming for this remodeling that will start sometime in mid-May. Yeah, literally the gate wa is almost up to the front door of the White Library. Having been there several times this past week, the, the lay down area is, it is extremely close and the requirements for this massive job is really changing yeah. things. Uh, 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 and there's some unexpected things yes, sir. that we're dealing with. So this slide answers some of the things that Mr. Watts was asking about earlier in terms of various components. You can begin to see when they're gonna be planned, when they're gonna be constructed. And all you're really doing with this is saying if this plays out this way, then these are the, the buckets or tranches of bond funds we'll pull down under previously authorized and approved bond dollars that have been passed. And revalidated as soft. Just to be uh, clear, they're not new bond campaigns we're going to run. No, sir. So make sure people understand that. Yes, sir. Uh, that's the last slide of the 2014 update. Any additional questions? Okay. Moving forward. Uh, the 139,000 million 2016 bond project. Uh, we designated 93 million for construction. Our admin cost to the tune of 12% is 16 million, 680,000. Inflation, uh, anticipation of inflation is 3.5% uh, and the contingency of 10% and also uh, allocated a budget of 10555000 for FF&E to the total uh, construction budget, project budget of $139 million. Uh, the project architect, as you have selected, is uh, Gensler, Turner Ramirez Architects. Uh, uh, POR was developed and completed by facility programming and consulting just uh, last month. And uh, like I said earlier, our construction management firm is AGCM. The current projected occupancy date is still fall 2021. W you know, we <coughs> can still achieve that date uh, with today's schedule, okay? Uh, from 2018 to the completion date of fall 2021, this is how we forecasted a look ahead on how we're going to execute the entire bond. 2019 funding will require 58 million. 2020 funding will require an additional 54 million. And to close out the, uh, the project 2021, we will uh, require a drawing again of uh, a little over 13 million to complete the FFNE you know, uh, of uh, the three uh, main structures and hopefully include inclusive of a central plant. Okay. There has been a prior draw to the 16 bond towards the bottom right of uh, $9,813,813. Okay. 
I had, I had one final question. Yes, sir. We had submitted to us at one point in time the proposal to tear down uh, the Athletic Center, Memorial Classroom Building, and Heritage Hall. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the Athletic Center and Memorial Classroom have, have been preserved. I, every time I walk into Heritage Hall, I, I ask myself, why are we tearing this building down if we're not tearing down Memorial Classroom? Uh, we had both facilities uh, structured, uh, reviewed by structural engineers, and uh, repeatedly the Heritage Hall uh, has been declared uh, as uh, uh, requiring too much investment to, to uh, in essence, uh, remodel and maintain. So it has been designated in the same program with an independent budget, a demolition budget, uh, execution uh, more than likely in 2019 yep. and uh, it, it was master planned and it also will provide the college the much needed parking space as we invest in the other remodeling of the East Campus. So bottom line it's just not cost effective to repair it. Yeah. It's not cost effective Do to repair based especially uh, the type of classroom it has. It's really small the type of space that it has uh, is that conducive to today's uh, design for classrooms? I'll, I'll remind everyone when we, Mr. Watts, do you, I, I'll, I'm going to remind you of the salt water that permeated the structure, uh, that permeated the steel infrastructure of the building that was pushing out the uh, the brick fascia and so forth. And this, this the, the structure is not the same at Heritage Hall as it is over in Memorial. We've had that assessed. And we had to close the uh, the north entrance for a, a long while. It's just like a a big band-aid on our front door over there. It was just it was horrible to see and kind of th to go through. But it, it the the structure was um, was compromised to a point where there's no recovery of the building. Um, and then I'll remind everybody, and I'd like to remind you, Mr. Watts, that 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 classroom space is being reprogrammed. And to leave it online would, would put us in a point of having excessive space. But first and foremost, the building is not, um, it, it, is un, it is not cost effective to, no, say, to save. We determined that a long time ago. So You've answered my question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> and to give confidence uh, to the uh, Memorial Classroom, we had it reviewed again uh, in 2017, and it was deemed uh, that it is worth salvaging and actually restoring. So we hope that that will be the permanent place for the Del Mar College administrators. Right. Any other questions for August? I have a question on the 2016 bond. Has the contract been finalized with Gensler, Turner, and Mears? Or where are we on the contract negotiations? Uh, we are on the cusp, and okay. I've, I've been asking every day. So we are, I want to say this far, August. I don't know if it's this far, but we, it's, it's any day now. Yeah, any, any day now, uh, there is just the details of the contract as opposed to the, you know, the more difficult financial part. So I, I really think that uh, by the end of this week, Monday, that we will have something solid for Dr. Escamilla to, to approve. And that does not come back to us. We've given our authorization for Dr. Escamilla right. to yes. negotiate. So good. Thank yeah, you. Lots of, legal, lots of legal details that we're yes, being very careful about. Great. Any other questions for August? Okay. Uh, just a quick comment. The idea with this presentation, are you at the end? I'm sorry. You are. The, the idea with this was to give it, again, a give an overview as we move into the financial aspects of this. So uh, that's, if there are any more questions, it doesn't seem like that. I think that's good, and I think that um, we're getting deeper and deeper into projects, so it would be great to have more regular reviews of this sort of stuff. It's we'll be glad to. Good. Glad to. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the fourth staff report is uh, 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 Lenora Keyes could not be here today. I believe Dr. Kathy West, there she is, is coming down to begin uh, the discussions of the 2019 budget update and process. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to do this today because Lenora cannot be with us. Uh, Lenora, myself, and John Johnson, um, our comptroller, and along with our executive team and Dr. Escamilla have been already working on the 2019 budget and we want to give you a 
an update today, and, and of course this is very, uh, emphasize the point that it is in preliminary stages. What we've done here on the next two slides, if we, we have taken our timeline and then the processes that we all go through to, to prepare the budget, develop the budget, and put those together. Um, and as you can see, we have already started, you know, we get back from Christmas break and we start right away working, looking towards the next year. And we look at the revenue assumptions and look at our enrollment projections, tuition rates, uh, property tax rates, and then, of course, state appropriations, but of course that's going to be the same as um, 18 for us in, in the coming year. And in February, we start taking a look at our strategic initiatives, and that's top of the list is, is our salaries, our, our people, and then what new initiatives that we see coming down the road, and also um, our equipment and construction needs. Now what I wanted to point out on, on this uh, calendar is as you see in the in the green is where that the green points will be the, the updates that we will give to you the board um, and so that uh, is distinguished from the black where that's our staff's um, processes. So if you remember, Lenore gave you a, an update in last month, or month before in February, on the status of the 2018 budget. In March, we've already did our um, budget committee meeting, and we also did budget training for our budget managers. And now today, we're, we're giving you an update on the preliminary budget. And then uh, for April, the <laughs> deans and directors and vice presidents will be reviewing budgets. May, we continue on, we get more into it in May. We're, we're looking at position lists, salaries, current positions, vacant positions. We start applying uh, what we hope to do for salary increases. The department uh, m and budgets are reviewed and complete, and then the executive team starts working on the review. Then there'll be another update um, to the board on, on June the 12th at the regular board meeting. Then we get into July again with at the regular board meeting another update. Um, there'll be room for an optional call meeting if needed. Then we get down to August where we get into the final stages uh, and we do our start doing our public hearings for the tax rate. And then at the end of August as usual with the approval. Dr. West, before yes. you go on. Uh, for me, this is helpful if you could go back to the slide because it does show all the steps and key dates coming back to us. I just want to make sure, do any of the regents have any questions about any of the timeline items? Are you get, is this going to give you the data and information when you'd like to see it? Is yeah. helpful? Okay, yes. good. Thank you. you. Okay, so I wanted to review um, the strategic initiatives, which we've already started to do. Uh, top of the list, and, and this goes along with, with uh, Dr. Lewis's and um, Lauren's presentation on the campus police department. And so we know that we're going to have to find dollars to support that initiative. And then also always at the top is wage increases for and personnel needs. Then also we have to fund new programs. Um, we did want to mention, you know, we, we have in our plan that we're doing, going to be doing our ERP, um, although that's not, the, the dollars for that are not going to come out of the operating budget, but that is something that's going to be on everybody's schedule is, is and we're real excited about um, our new ERP. And then, of course, any kind of maintenance and operate, operating needs. Um, so what we've done, and we want to accentuate the fact that this is preliminary, to start out in this very preliminary budget forecast, we are currently assuming 0% enrollment growth. But we can adjust that as, as the summer goes on, uh, or as till we get in closer you know, to the summer if we start to see we have a pickup in enrollment. And then our tuition and fees assumptions, of course we have the $3 per semester hour, that you guys voted in. Um, keep in mind that we now get the uh, continuing education funding for students 16 and older. 
that we are excited about. We're going to have in enhanced uh, summer Pell this summer. And we are assuming that our discounts uh, and exemptions and waivers will, will be at the 18 to 19 percent level. And then moving on to our tax assumptions, we are conservatively estimating a 2 percent taxable property value increase for this preliminary run. We are using the current M&O tax rate of the 0 .205700. On the first bullet, just remind us what uh, last year's tax, final tax property value increase was last year. John, do you have that? Off the right. And that's my point, was we're conservative, trying to be conservative in building a budget. That's what you're, what you're doing, correct? Right, okay. right. Sta yes. <coughs> um, and then, of course, we all know the, the property tax valuations come in at the end of July. So, and then we are going to also maintain the contingency the six hundred thousand um, dollar industrial property value appeal contingency of the six hundred k. And implicit in that is that this is the year that we don't have changes in state funding because we're we're at the second year of the biennium. So it's not on there's a specific item I didn't see it, but that's that's a given. Another right. assumption. Right. Can we not assumption? Can we go back to the tax uh, property tax uh, assumption for just a second? Okay. So as we roll through the timeline, do we get an early indication from the appraisal district what our property tax rate might be? Because I realize one of the reasons we wait until the end of July is because after all of the appeals, until they finally give us a certified tax. Do we get early indications of what they think the property tax we increase, stable decrease might be? We do. Uh, I think both John and I are receiving those calls as well as Lenora. <laughs> and so the 2%, I think, is the is the early, early um, uh, verbal uh, number at this point. And so we are, we, I get calls as probably as much as John does uh, from uh, Mr. Canales on a regular basis. And I think they just start firming up here and we start meeting face to face right at the latter part of this month and then we really just meet more regularly. John, I think, is attending some meetings as well as now um, our new representative on the board. Um, I Mr. Chapa. Mr. Chapa, sorry, Mr. Chapa is a friend. Uh, Armando Chapa, yes, will be helping us with those um, with those meetings as well. Okay. Okay. So here is our projected preliminary uh, 2019 uh, revenue budget, and what we're showing you here, you start out to the left with our current uh, FY 2018 budget, and then we are showing you the increases or decreases that we expect based on the assumptions that I just went over to get over to the right to what we're projecting that our preliminary 2019 revenue budget will be. And as you can see, if you look all the way down to the bottom, everything nets out to 137,702 increase. Uh, a big part of that, the fact that that, that is a rather small increase is that if you remember we budgeted for a 5% enrollment growth in 17-18 which remember we were we were right up there in August and then we left for Harvey and so we saw enrollment staying flat so so we're really hoping to see that enrollment come back but being you know conservative but we do have to go ahead and adjust out that that uh, enrollment growth so that's why you see the decrease of the 1.5 but then we have an increase in the property taxes of 1.2 and that's very conservatively you know that that number could go higher but that's conservatively you know keeping the MO rate the same and then only the two percent um, growth in, in property value Dr. West, yes. I have a question about our, uh, our veterans. I think everybody probably heard that great big spiel yesterday uh, on the national news as well as the local news about all veterans can go to school free now and go to college and da da da, da. Does that mean we're going to get increased money or is, are we going to keep the same amount of money and still not get funded 100%? Do we know? Um, I don't know about the specific program that you're referring to I didn't hear that I just know that um, as part of Hazelwood um, we currently do that that's factored into that 19 percent waiver um, situation that we were presenting 
uh, where is it, that last line on the first bullet, tuition discount exemptions and waivers on the academic credit side, those are included in there for the Hazelwood program. I don't know about this new program that you're talking to. If there's Supposedly it was new money, so I just uh, thought, we, well, we, maybe that will help us with that. We okay. would, we would welcome that, but I don't know about that yet. Right. Dr. West on this, sorry. Oh, okay. Back one slide. Um, on this slide, uh, already you can see the setup coming that effectively we're saying we only have a net increase in revenues on a conservative basis of $138,000. And yet, if you think about all the items we need to fund, it'll probably clearly be more than 138000 Well, correct? Is that where the story's heading? But that's what we're saying right now. Yeah. And it's okay. at, at this point, we recognize that we'll have to adjust one way or the other. And, uh, but that's the story at this very preliminary stage. Very preliminary. Okay. Okay, so what we wanted to do here is show you what we're expecting uh, for the expenditures, and what, what we're gonna have to plan for. Um, of course, always at the top of the list is, is giving our, our personnel increases. And so, um, again, these are conservative numbers we're showing um, the faculty with their annual increases that they that they get usually and so that adds up to the 487,000 and then you see the components of the exempt and non-exempt with the one percent raise so with salary and benefits together that would be 704,000 and then the other items that we have to take into consideration which we're estimating right now to be in the neighborhood of one to 1.5 million increase. Of course, is insurance, which is our property insurance, employee benefits, the campus police department, new program initiatives, repairs and maintenance, and of course, contingencies. So then we, we get to this slide where we project out what we are planning, very preliminary uh, expenditure budget. I start out over to the left with our current um, budget for fiscal year 18 we did want to show you that at remember in February when Lenora came to you and said okay enrollments not what we expected but we're going to still reserve our protect our contingency so we're finding these savings and um, so we were able to do that both on the salary and benefit side and also find things in the maintenance and operation non salary side to to get that savings of 1.9 million for this year. So then our projected actuals, then we estimate to be able to come into our revenue levels and protect that contingency. And then here we're showing the $137,000 increases to salaries. It would be finding further savings uh, of the 568,000 you know, offset by the increases that we know that we're gonna need to have for campus police and new programs, et cetera. And then that would bring us to a balanced budget, expenditure budget of the 97,685. And the last thing we wanted to mention, um, we know and we recognize the fact that a, um, a five-year forecast, or at least a three to five-year forecast, is very important in managing the, uh, the financial stability of the college. And so, and we've been talking about this, and this year we are planning to have a five-year forecast at the end of our FY19 budget, along with just the current annual budget, but also a five-year budget. And we've already started looking at models from other colleges. And here we just wanted to touch with you, you know, the same that we have to do for the current year, you also have to do for those five years, and that's determine your revenue assumptions, determine your expense assumptions, and look at models. Like I said, we're already looking at models that other colleges are using, and so that is in progress. So we wanted to tell you all that. A couple of questions. It looks like we're not increasing the faculty salary anything in addition to the annual increase. Is right. Okay. That and my concern is where is that going to put us in, in comparison to the ISDs? Are, are we? Well, we're fifth in the state. We remain fifth again in the state as, 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 as compared to the rest of our peers. 
to answer your question, I don't know where they are um, this year. So I don't know what this year's dollars are. I don't know what their salary level is. Um, I do know as compared to the 50 peers across the state that we remain at number five in the state um, for, for uh, that's the document that I've shared with you before. So uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head, John. I don't know if you do. Um, so I can't answer that question as compared to the school district. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I mean, I knew where we were last year. I just don't know what the current numbers are. I just don't want to. And I'm wondering if we're going to get any input from the faculty as, as a board. So uh, are they going to be satisfied with this? Well, I, I didn't come to the board. It come to. Yeah, we 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 we, we meet we meet with uh, with uh, the faculty council, and that's where we begin hearing those things. Uh, that we, we have those conversations. And are they going to be satisfied? I can tell you what they're going to tell me at that meeting and so forth. And, and I can tell you I'm not going to be satisfied because I haven't been satisfied since I got here, but we continue to work towards it. But I am at least um, somewhat satisfied with the fact that we're, we remain fifth uh, amongst our peers of 50 in the state of Texas. Another couple and, of and we'll be glad to bring uh, Craig Brashears. I don't know. I, th I don't. Th I think he may have stepped out. He may have stepped out. We'll bring the faculty council um, to um, to the meetings and, and for for feedback and so forth. Okay. A couple of questions. Right now we're at an eight percent rollback, and there's talk that I've heard about moving to a four percent rollback, and then in addition to that, having to put it on the ballot. Yes. So my concern is we're, it looks like we're trying to keep the, the tax rate really low. Well, well, that talk was last year's legislative session. And since we're not in legislative session, it wouldn't be up for this year, but it could be for a future year. And, well, and my concern is in the future because we've got all these buildings come on, on, coming online, and I would expect increases in costs there. Yes. And, and I'm, my fear is that we're going to easily go over the 4% rollback, and I, I would hate to have to put that on the ballot. Yeah. So so w th that's been the case for the past two or three legislative sessions, actually, and so it keeps coming back. We, we, we watch it as an association in Austin, and it is, it is something that we're, not only ourselves, but school districts, cities, and others, other taxing entities are very um, cognizant of that, of that uh, proposal out there. Um, I heard something from the governor's office not too long ago about that. It's several months, I think. Uh, that he was he was uh, talking about that, but we'll watch it closely as the legislative session goes. I understand what you're saying. And my final question or concern is: Do we forecast the gap basis financial statements? Uh, I would say so. Yes. Okay, because we're, we're going to have a lot of depreciation coming under the gap basis, and those are going to be used to to rate our bonds. Am I correct? Um. Well. We let's let's get Dave let's get Dave up yeah. here for that particular question and yeah. and uh, and Tom. Can we defer that till they oh, absolutely. It'll roll right into that next. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. It's going to be a perfect question for that scenario there. But it gives him a few minutes to figure out the answer. There you go. And, and <laughs> <laughs> as he's penciling that in, and let me just say, uh, go back to your first question, Mr. Bennett, if I may. Um, that's we have plug-in numbers, the one percent, the you know the annual increase for faculty and so forth. And I would add that uh, the other councils will be important to hear from as well, um, the, the exempt and non-exempt councils as we look at all employee base as we move ahead. So I'll be including them. I just want you to know that we'll we'll bring bring I've them. I've gotten in. feedback from from the taxpayers that they're okay with an increase to give uh, an increase in taxes to bring and attract. Uh, good faculty members. Absolutely. So I'm getting positive feedback about that. So I Thank just want to express that. that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. It's very positive. Okay. Any other questions? I just want to kind of echo that last point that, that Mr. Bennett just made. In, in looking at what is going to be a tight budget because of enrollment issues, I want us to have a really sharp pencil as we go through the next several months in those, those enrollment figures because that drives yes. the revenue side and the expense side. Absolutely. But but I also want to understand what the proposed cuts might be and what the impact of those cuts might be and if there is a need to have an honest discussion about the tax rate, yes. not just a valuation change but a tax rate change. So let's have that honest discussion at this table and let us make that decision. Uh, so I don't want to preclude you. I, I appreciate 
the conservative nature that you come to this preliminary budget discussion with. Okay. But I don't want to I don't want to leave you the impression that a tax rate increase is completely off the table. If we can justify it, and not just rationalize it, but if we can justify it, I'm willing to have that conversation and to bring that forward. Pre the better. Yeah. Pre appreciate appreciate that much. Now, here's one of the things. Here's what what's um, very much appreciate that that comment, uh, Regent Scott. As you relate as it relates to enrollment, we don't know what enrollment will be. Uh, we do know we have some factors that are supporting us. We do we have numbers right now. Enrollment started um, last week. Uh, I think we're in several Monday. Monday. Okay, sorry, that's this week. It's only Tuesday. Last, last Monday. Yes, that's right. Okay, I thought I was going crazy. So uh, enrollment, early enrollment has started, and we're watching those numbers daily. Thank you, uh, Dean Dominguez, for uh, for sending me that 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 personal update every day. And um, we're not going to get excited about uh, overly excited about things right now, um, but I just want you to know that we're watching it, and that when we do project and forecast uh, enrollment, that it is largely based off of summer enrollment. So really total of summer enrollment. That's how we forecast into the fall. That's what we do. And we usually set that number. When we set 5% last year, it's because we saw numbers of what, 6 and 7 and 8% in the summer. Okay, still a conservative estimate. And remember, we went into the fall at 6. And, and Hurricane Harvey blew it all away. And we were at 98% paid. I'm just reminding us of some things. Um, it's very much on our mind. I've been <laughs> I've been calling Rito at all hours of the night and all days of the week and obsessing this. I'm, a, I'm an enrollment, I'm a former enrollment guy and that's where I got my start and I sweat that every, every, every year for this reason. Rito, you told me you're, I'm one of the few presidents that you've worked with that sweats it like I do. Uh, we'll be bringing that information back to you. Jake, I believe you had a question, didn't you also? Uh, Kathy, I just wanted to ask you, what drove our budget to go up last year was faculty salaries and the increase in or starting up the police force, right? Right. And the insurance. Mm -hmm. But since police, so we've already allowed for the police force and we're not increasing the faculty salaries, why is our budget going up this year? A couple of million. Well, I mean, really, it's it's only going up 138,000 now. Uh, and that's at this point. Yeah, and, and that's and very preliminary. It is preliminary. But to answer that, uh, let me answer that a little further. There, w there are other costs that are coming up that we're um, – that we're realizing as we speak. Insurance costs, I think we just got a good number the other day, Tammy, if, you're, if, if I'm not mistaken, but insurance costs go up, uh, administrative costs go up. There, there's lots of different things um, that'll happen uh, along the way. So it's, we're, we're holding tight right now with a very tight budget that very much, that is to the degree that we can reflects last year's budget. But again, we, we expect some things to give and take um, as, we, as we solidify it. We're just trying to bring it earlier in, uh, to you all, and we'll have more, we'll have firmer discussions here in the next months coming. Right, it, and if you notice the more frequent um, updates to y'all in the schedule so and, that we can start looking at those tax rates. That was a request yeah. that you all made last year, and we absolutely agreed, and w the thing was to have more meetings in place, and so, you know, we're bringing your money, uh, the, 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 the good numbers, the, the, sorry, the good, the good things about this, the good thing about bringing these numbers earlier to you is that we get them, bring them earlier to you, but then we have to speculate even more, and they're softer numbers. That's the only thing. But the good news is we're bringing them to you earlier, and we're talking about things. And we're, here, we're getting your feedback, which is very important. Any other questions for Dr. West before we move on with the rest of our very long agenda today? Okay. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, college President's Report. Dr. Very, qu very quickly. So on March 8th, I, uh, I did attend. I remain on the T Texas Association of Community Colleges uh, Legislative Committee. And we are setting that agenda, and I think we will have the agenda earlier than we've ever had, at least in my tenure uh, here at the college. Uh, we should have something by mid-summer, uh, if not sooner. Uh, we're thinking, the, I'll remind everybody that the annual meeting is here in Corpus Christi, and we may have it then, and that'll be exciting. Uh, March 22nd, I had the... Um, Pizza with the president. Uh, once, a, once every big once every fall and spring, I meet with the with, with the students. We had a lot of students come in. A lot of pizza was eaten. A lot of great questions. A lot of things that we're talking about here. And I'm getting a lot of feedback from them that that that, um, that influences uh, the things we do on a day to day basis. And just quickly, um, this is an update: the junior college audit report. 
Um, I got a letter from the uh, governor's office. I think we included, did we include it in the back? I, I didn't, okay, so it was a, a request from the governor's office um, to make sure that our, um, that our uh, safety and security, uh, JCAR we call it, a report was presented to the board. Um, we, um, I just want everybody to know that w it, the letter from the governor's um, office was missing some, some information and therefore had us out of compliance. We are in compliance. We did report this, uh, this re we did have this report to you all back in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, Councillor. And so we are up to date. And so if there's anything out there about a governor's report and JCAR, we are in compliance. That concludes my report. Thank you. Um, American Association, Association of Community College Trustees is the um, membership organization that our trustees uh, and regents for all community colleges across the country uh, participate in, and it's our, our single biggest source for our continuing education. Um, there was a special uh, conference that we took advantage of uh, back in March. Uh, it was actually in San Antonio. We had five of our regents go. The conference was called Governance Leadership Institute. Uh, Natalie went with us and uh, she's been collecting some information and passing it on to the rest of the regions from that conference. It was really good. I do want to give the chance for any of the regions that did attend if they've got anything that they'd like to highlight from that conference that was uh, uh, particularly important or relevant or timely or what they learned. Who would like to start? Sandra? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things, you know, when you go to these conferences and you get to talk to people that are doing the same thing, but this one was especially interesting because I think it covered so much and we, um, we had different presenters than we usually have and they brought a different uh, idea and different ideas and we broke into small groups. One of the ones that I did was uh, on the child care center and to tell you the truth, I felt very inadequate because I didn't really know as much as I should have about what we're doing with child care. And that's on my program for June to get caught up. However, in this conference, because it was so interesting that there was some ethical questions in almost every uh, meeting that we went to, for instance, uh, that the trustees should support the mission of the school. Um, they should support the fundraising and contributing to the foundation as we can. Uh, it also says that we should not be meddling in day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the school, nor should we n appear at campus to conduct investigations. Those are the little things that um, I think pass us by, and Augie has been so good about doing the ethics workshop. And also, um, we should not visit to such an extent that we are perceived as interfering or micromanaging. So those were the important things that I caught through stories that <coughs> other trustees <coughs> talked about. And it was a g great conference, best one I've been to. Mr. Bennett. It, it was an incredibly good conference. Um, they, <coughs> I've been to a couple of these, so I'm fairly new at it. But they emphasize a line of demarcation between governance and running the college. And they, they gave us several examples of that. Um, some of the case studies were quite honestly appalling. Um, it, it, it was, um, the, the one from San Francisco was just enlightening if nothing else. Um, but they had issued a closure letter to that college, which meant they had to determine what to do with their buildings, give them away. Hey, those things are scary. So, the, and the board should have been aware of the problems way before they started happening. So we've got a big obligation at this board level, and it, it goes on for, for decades after we leave. So it, it was very enlightening. Now, they gave out a book, very good outline. Um, it, 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 again, emphasizes the line of demarcation, and it is less pages than our agenda this month. So. <laughs> <laughs> Now, they did hand out some little trinkets, and I'm wearing one. Mm -hmm. Ethical decision-making, they stress that, and it's terribly important. So it was a, a great, great conference. Thank, Thank you. you.
Dr. Donovan, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, you know, it, it was a great four-day conference, you know, and it, it's always gratifying to see that Del Mar implements some of the content that was involved in the, in the conference. Um, from ethics all the way down to the role of college and student success, as well as accountability and, and, and a great overview of the political environment and what we need to be aware of. So as far as information, uh, it, 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 it was a great uh, four-day conference. Thank you. Cheryl, anything you'd like to share? Uh, Dr. Pamela Fisher, um, <coughs> who is a consultant uh, with ACCT and also runs independent consulting, and she's a former community college president, she ran a, a couple of sessions uh, at which she used case studies to uh, – to have us discuss is, is uh, Mr. Bennett and uh, Ms. Mrs. Messbarger alluded to. I thought those were very powerful because it gave us a chance to look at the scenarios and then discuss what uh, we thought our response should be uh, and then to have a, a larger group discussion about what the responses should be and how, how the responsibility of community college regents to ask the right questions early on, to be uh, setting the right objectives, monitoring those that, that information, uh, and then to be acting uh, early enough in, in a process at a board table uh, to to be able to, to circumvent uh, or to intervene in, in those kind of instances. And then what to do even when your best laid plans uh, go awry. There was a session that Alamo Colleges did on, on what they're doing to secure campuses and had us think through exercises on what to do and what our role is in the middle of a crisis situation, uh, how the board speaks, how the college speaks, how the board speaks as one, and the opportunities and challenges that are a part of that. So I thought that was very insightful and, and a good learning style, and I gained a lot out of it. Great. Uh, I was the fifth person to attend, and I won't certainly repeat any of the good material that's been shared, but there was uh, lots of timely topics, one particularly one that we're getting ready to address, and that's the changes in SACs that Dr. Lewis has been talking to us about related to the boards and the board's role, and they uh, introduced and help us understand some of those topics. That'll be things we'll be dealing with uh, uh, in the coming months as a board. So it was very, very timely. So I appreciate everyone that made the personal commitment to uh, leave their businesses and their their jobs and represent the board and go up there. So it was very helpful. Um, the next on the agenda is pending business, and if you uh, we're in good shape, so there's nothing necessary to review on that. And with that, we'll move into consent agenda. <coughs> we have two items for consent. The approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of February 13th, 2018, and the acceptance of the investments for March 2018. Does anyone want to pull either one of these items off for individual discussion? And if not, I'll entertain a motion for Move acceptance. To accept, Mr. Chair. We have a motion by Gabe, a second. Second. We have several seconds. Sounds like maybe that was Sandra getting to it first. Uh, any further discussion by Regents? Any public comment on the two consent item items? Uh, all in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. Any yes. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Yes. Moving now to the regular agenda. Uh, item number three, uh, just a discussion of possible action related to the college's quarterly investment report. And our uh, visiting with us today is Mr. Ronald Ross from Austin. Come on down. And um, sorry, we uh, had such a long agenda, we're just now getting to you, and I know you need to get back on the road, so we, we, glad, we will listen clearly and succinctly while you go through this report. Hey, that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, I know how it is sometimes when, you know, you've got to address certain situations. So uh, basically, you know, I always like to talk about anything that might happen in the news, economic data points, and there's been something that's been dominating the news, uh, and that's around the tariff issue. And so uh, I guess probably about uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, the administration came out and said they're going to impose $50 billion in tariffs against China. And then they came back after China said that they were going to retaliate against us and impose their $50 billion. So it went up to $100 billion. billion. So you've been getting this tit for tat type uh, situation. And as, uh, like I said, you know, with, with everything that's going on, you start to see market volatility. And whenever you see that market volatility, you've got to distinguish between equity market volatility versus fixed income market volatility. So with the equity market volatility, again, you saw big moves in the Dow Jones. One day you would be down 500 uh, points. By the end of the day, you may be up 200 points. So these extreme you know, moves and uh, volatility in that market. But as far as the fixed income markets, you start to see, uh, you definitely saw a gradual increase on the short end, which is the, the, the part that you guys and your portfolio operates on. But on the longer end, 
uh, you start to see a, a little bit more of a flattening like we saw last year around this time. And that flattening had to do with uh, the market just basically trying, the fixed income market's trying to price in a tail risk that was associated with the, um, with the tariffs. And so uh, you looked at the 10 year, the 10 years started out around maybe 295, uh, 290 and it moved down to around 277. Today I think we're at 280 in the, in the 30, you went two Run around, went from around 314 down to uh, I think today we're at 3 percent. So you, you're seeing a little bit uncertainty. Uh, but a good thing about the tariffs that have been issued, there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, one is about 60 days before it's actually imposed and implemented. Two, you also saw, um, you know, you know that we're still in negotiation process. And three, which just happened today, was that uh, the president of China came out and said that they're willing to open up some of the, uh, you know, uh, open up their economy to foreign investors. So that gave a nice little pop to the, the equity markets today, and rates moved up a little bit based on that. So whenever you have this type of uh, uncertainty, you kind of got to go to got to go back to your fundamentals. And so one of the first things you got to look at look at some of the uh, some of the uh, economic data points. So you saw GDP is still strong. Uh, GDP got revised up. I want to say from 2.5 uh, percent up to 2.9 percent for the fourth quarter. Uh, we've got we also starting to see unemployment rates that are continuing to still stay low. Unemployment claims last week came in, it came in still at the lowest since we've seen since 1973. Uh, the non-farm payroll number, basically what it was, it was a little bit softer than what we wanted, but it was on par with the average of the last couple of years. Uh, also, you're starting to see inflation still kind of picking up. Then we've still got the tax reform and the tailwind that is associated with, uh, with the tax reform because we haven't seen any kind of corporate tax rate at 21% since the 1940s, so we can't really uh, 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 quantify that. And also, we got an interest rate increase in March. So we went up from uh, 125 to 150. Now we're at between 150 and 175. And also, another couple of things that happened was that the Fed basically said that they anticipate a couple more interest rate increases in 2018. Uh, I think they said three more maybe in 2019 and, and another subsequent three more in 2020. So those were all very positive signs for the economy. Uh, as I said before, race, they struggle, they're struggling to find the right balance because there's always just this tail risk with the tariffs. And so before we start to see a steepening up uh, uh, of the yield curve in February based on, uh, based on some of the outliers of the economy, but now we're starting to see that back end started, uh, starting to uh, kind of flatten out. Now getting into uh, the individual investments for the for the for the college is you're starting to see where w on this is that you see your fiscal quarter earnings at two uh, 237,000 yields <coughs> at 156 versus the benchmark at 163 and we're in a you know, on that short end we're still in a rising rate environment so we've been continuing to keep the wham kind of short and looking for opportunities on the yield curve to continue to build up um, but also if you can see where we were last year you can see where we're almost a little bit over 100,000 more in, 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 uh, in income than what we got last year. And just you can see the difference in where the rates were at 64 basis points, where uh, 61 basis points to 156 basis points. Here's uh, some of the diversification. And one of the, the avenues that we, ha and I didn't add this to the, to the bottom of the slide, that where we've seen a lot of opportunity is in commercial paper. And so we have continued to increase our exposure to com commercial paper that is within policy because currently right now in three month commercial paper you can get around 185, uh, 185 well currently uh, as of the end of February 28th of 18 you get 185 now you can get around maybe 230 in commercial paper and this is high quality commercial paper and so if you look at where 230 is 230 is where you can go out two years in a government agency but we always want to make sure we stay within policy uh, as far as around the commercial paper mandate and also get diversification in some of the other sectors. And on the short end, if you want to go out maybe a year, treasuries are where you're starting to see some of that uh, pickup. Here's the uh, series 2016-2017 tax bonds. As you can see uh, the yield on that was 140 and we had extended that portfolio. Now that portfolio is starting to roll down uh, versus the benchmark in the fiscal quarter year uh, quarter earnings is 
Now here's a, uh, some more of the diversification that what you see, we, I've added the CP and we've increased our exposure in CP to around 17%. Uh, I think the policy allows around 25%. If you see, and I look at the portfolio that you guys are running are very similar to money market portfolios. And a lot of money market portfolios, they're around, uh, they're running around 50% in commercial paper. So we're still at the very, very short end and, and taking advantage. But we also want to make sure that we have the diversification and, and stay true to the quality in the portfolio. Uh, with that being said, are there any other questions for me? Any questions, Regents? <clears throat> Are you ready for your test? <laughs> <clears throat> We're getting uh, six different interest rates. What is the average? How do you figure it out? Overall, our overall average. So the overall Actually, average five. of the whole entire portfolio, five. that's including the bond funds yeah. and the, I think we're at 1.499. Uh, so if you, you look at you look at the uh, the bond funds and the regular, um, everything ex excluding the bond funds, if you put those together, I think we're at 1.499, so almost 150. And, and that's just average overall? And yeah, that's common. average overall. Global. And I think that's a, we've come a long way yeah. and as far as, and the good thing about it, we're staying a little bit short so we can take advantage of opportunities uh, as time goes on. Other questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Safe travels back. Thank you. Um, item number four and 4A and 4B are connected and I'm gonna ask, I think, um, in Lenora's absence, uh, Dr. West is coming back up for that along with Dave and Tom an entourage probably. Uh, discussion and possible action to approve the issuance of series 2018A and series 2018B Delmar College District limited tax bonds for the purpose of financing portions of the capital improvements uh, approved by the voters. Yes. And so Dave Gordon of the Strata Aquino Hosa is going to go over the aspects of the two issuances and I will turn it to him. Thank you Dr. West. Uh, good afternoon everybody. Oh, you know what, I'll call for a second, I think. Thanks. I just was reminded um, in my sinus fog today that we did not approve number three and we need to. The investment report? My apologies. I'm so I'm to approve. I have a motion to approve. Uh, we have a second from Carol, so Gabe and Carol. Do we have any further discussions by the regents on item number three? Any public comments on item number three? All in favor of acceptance, uh, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, sorry. No problem. So again, we're here to talk about the uh, issuance of, of bonds from your 2014 and 2016 elections. Uh, as you just heard from your investment advisor, um, rates have continued to rise a little bit over the last uh, um, uh, number of months, although uh, from a historical perspective, they're still quite low. Uh, page uh, three in your presentation of, is a depiction of the yield curve. The uh, the current um, AAA MMD yield curve is, is represented by the um, kind of the orange diamonds in the middle. Um, we are still below the, the average since 2000, which is represented by the, the green uh, the boxes. And you can kind of see the range of rates during that period of time. Uh, rates have um, risen over the last uh, couple of years. If you look back, for example, uh, in 2016, when you issued um, your last larger um, series of obligations, rates have risen about 100 basis points across the entire yield curve. So at that time, we actually hit uh, pretty close to the bottom of the market on, on every maturity except for the, uh, the shorter ones. Again, having said that, we're still uh, at uh, a low interest rate environment from a, a long-term historical perspective. Just real briefly, in terms of your outstanding debt, uh, if you look on page five, you'll see your outstanding general obligation bonds. Um, You've got uh, relatively level debt service until 2023, and then you can see it drops off significantly after that, and your final maturity goes out to 2046. Um, you do have um, very high ratings, um, AA+, plus, AA2, AA, and the three rating agencies, um, Fitch, uh, Moody's, and S&P. Um, again, you guys should be quite proud of that. It just speaks to you, the, the, you know, how well you guys have managed your finances. Um, I've, the next call date on your general obligation debt is in 2021. Uh, I'll just real quickly mention that one of the things that came up with the last um, uh, tax law change that, that started um, on January 1st is that the ability to do an, an advance refunding um, has been eliminated for tax-exempt obligations. Um, you guys have done advance refundings a number of times. 
the definition of that is anytime you call debt uh, or you do the refinancing more than 90 days prior to the call date. Uh, part of the reason I mentioned that is that um, unless, unless it makes sense on a taxable basis, which every once in a while it does, depending on where the yield curve is, uh, you won't really have an, op an opportunity to refinance any of this debt until um, um, May of 2021. On, uh, on your combined fee revenue bonds, which are the other outstanding obligations you have, uh, you can see that there's, uh, there's basically one series left with, the, with addition to another payment uh, on the, the, the remaining 2008 bonds, basically level debt service um, after this year. Uh, the next call date on those are in, in 2026, and you can see a slightly lower ratings, which is to be expected from revenue bonds. So uh, as um, August mentioned, um, what we're doing here is we're mimicking the, um, the construction plan that he laid out. Um, he, had, he had spoke of um, the 2018 requirements, 2019, 20, and going forward. So in essence, what we're doing here today is we're talking about the issuance of, of the uh, requirements for 2018 and 2019. Uh, that would allow you to set your tax rate this summer, go into uh, the, the, the uh, uh, the, the new fiscal year, be able to spend those proceeds uh, throughout the fall and, and going into next year. Uh, if we look, this particular chart on page eight basically <coughs> shows you kind of where you stand prior to the issuance of debt. Uh, in essence, this middle section of the chart will be kind of dropped in on the next slide. You can see your, um, uh, your taxable assessed valuation, uh, the freeze adjusted taxable assessed valuation on the left hand side, uh, just over 24 uh, billion. And as Dr. West mentioned, uh, we've programmed in here a 2% increase in assessed valuation. Um, obviously, you know, the hope is that that comes in higher. And then we've got um, a 3% the following year and then uh, kind of uh, tails off after the number of years. Now uh, you can see what the existing debt service you have in this uh, next column. And then again, there's a spot in the middle where we'll, we'll show you the, uh, the proposed debt service for the new obligations in just a second. Uh, and your INS tax rate or your debt tax rate is currently um, 5.346 cents, so um, uh, five and a quarter cents basically. And if you were to not issue any debt um, and if your assessed valuation goes up 2% um, as, as um, illustrated here, um, you would have a very, very minor tax rate decrease. So in, uh, for all intents and purposes, again, with relatively level debt service and, and modest growth in assessed valuation, there's basically no kind of um, stress on, on your tax rate um, to speak of prior to the issuance of any debt. So on the next page, what we've done here is illustrated uh, the issuance of um, uh, 48.625 uh, million from the uh, 2014 election. Uh, we're designating those, those are the, the series 2018A bonds. And then uh, 61.5 million of the 2018, um, from the, uh, the 2016 election, those are the 2018B bonds. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll note that the, uh, the uh, resolutions in front of you authorize that amount in terms of the total um, uh, issuance amount. Uh, we're actually focused on really what the project fund deposit would be, which is, are those numbers. Um, and that also is what counts against your voted, death, voted debt. Um, the, uh, the actual par amount will be something less than that just because these bonds will be issued at a premium. Uh, in this case, the, for example, the uh, 2018 are showed at 44 million 135 and the 2018 B are showed at uh, uh, 55, 790. But it'll partly depend on where yields are exactly at the time of issuance and of what the coupons are. Um, these bonds, uh, we've, we've modeled this at current market rates plus 25 basis points or 0.25%. Uh, that would be right at 4%, uh, just, or just slightly there of, over that. Um, what's in the resolutions you have right now would allow us to go up to 4.5%. So again, we have some cushion in here and, and hopefully rates stay within a reasonable range um, between now and the time that we go to market. Um, if you were to uh, issue this debt um, as, as planned, um, there would be approximately uh, uh, just shy of a two um, penny increase in your um, debt tax rate. Um, we've actually lowered um, the first couple of principal payments just to hit that, that, um, that two penny uh, rate. And, and, and uh, so it's slightly off from level debt service, but, but very close to that. Any, any questions on this page before I go on to the, uh, the next page? I'm, I'm a little confused. I thought you said that we wouldn't have to raise the debt rate when we plan it. When we, when we set our tax rate in the fall, but now you're saying that we will have to raise it a couple of cents? Well, I, I, I don't Are you talking about when the last time I was here? No, no. A little while ago, you said we wouldn't have to raise the debt rate. No, no, no. I'm the sorry. Tax rate. 
if, if you look if you look back on the previous page uh, what I'm saying is prior to contemplating any issuance of debt you in essence had a, a level playing field where you wouldn't yeah. have to do anything um, is as you recall from um, uh, a couple of slides, slides prior to this and you can also see on the left hand side here your your debt is in essence level for the next till 2023 okay. so um, if, if you're if you had no assessed valuation growth or, or no property value growth with level debt service you would have a flat tax rate there, was, there, there would be no increase or decrease okay. Okay. That's so what I, that's what I heard yeah so what I meant to say here was um, there's nothing kind of built in already you know, yeah. prior to the contemplation of issuing any debt okay. but if you're going to issue um, you know 110 million dollars unfortunately given the fact that it is level debt service till 2023 there, there would have to be a tax rate increase okay. um, again this is somewhat of a psychological barrier but we've structured this slightly to, to hit a, a, a two penny increase um, with the idea that um, it would be flat for two years because the next issuance that's contemplated would be 2020 and then assuming that everything um, grows as planned you'll see that there might be some future increases as well that would be required so in, in terms of the entire debt program uh, again you had initially uh, an election for um, 157 million for the 2014 bonds uh, we've issued uh, about um, 83 million of, of that already uh, you had a 139 million dollar election for the 2016 uh, which uh, as was mentioned you've issued 9.8 million of that so far um, so what's programmed and this mimics again the the schedule that August had eight laid out earlier uh, would be to issue 110 million dollars um, um, this summer as we'll show the schedule here in a minute uh, prior to setting your tax rate for 2019 that would take care of the requirements for FY 18 as well as FY 19 uh, the next issuance then would be in 2020 and then the final one be, would be in 2021 and obviously those those numbers that are in those are, are subject to change depending upon your actual schedule um, and, and how your construction bids come in and and uh, if, if, uh, if if all goes well there might be some um, additional cushion left over as August mentioned you, some of your projects have been coming in under budget uh, so ultimately um, depending on that that final timing uh, there might be a, the, the height of the tax rate on the uh, INS side or debt um, side might be uh, just over nine cents. Uh, so again, that partly depends on all that schedule. There are also opportunities to restructure some of those um, um, those future issuances depending upon how that is done just because your debt will be dropping off in 2023, which gives an opportunity to, to kind of flatten that out a little bit. We have modeled the, the future um, um, issuances in 2020 and 2021 with additional cushion in terms of, of interest rates. Um, so we've got an, an additional um, 25 basis points in the, in the 2020 and then a, another 50 basis points in the 2021 with the idea that if rates rise, we're kind of contemplating that. Obviously, if they, if they stay low uh, or they um, actually drop, then that would be to the benefit of the, uh, the college. Uh, finally, on this page, there's a little bit of a, a INS tax rate history on the right-hand side from 2015 it was just over four cents and again uh, um, 2018 uh, was five and a, and, and a quarter basically or five and a third and then it would go up by about two cents this coming year if you decided to move forward with this <coughs> and, rate, and rate stayed kind of within that range as we're expecting any questions on that okay I'll move to the schedule then uh, so what you would be authorizing today would be again two um, debt resolutions which in essence give um, your staff the, uh, uh, the authority to kind of move forward with the sales. Um, the, the 2018 um, A bonds again would be um, for, the, from, for the issuance of, of obligations for, from the 2014 election uh, in the amount of uh, 48 million 625. Um, the final maturity date for that would be 815 of 48. So a 30 year debt in essence would be the maximum we could go. Um, and again, we've, um, there's a limitation of an interest rate of 4.5%. Um, in, ter in terms of the 2018B bonds, those would be from the 2016 election uh, in a maximum amount of 61.5 million, um, also 30 year debt and, and a rate limitation of 4.5%. So we would go through the process uh, of um, preparing the offering document, um, working with the rating agencies. And I know the question came up, uh, Mr. Bennett, about um, uh, whether or not the rating agencies look at GAAP you know, budget projections and all that type of thing. And, and certainly they're gonna go through your, your financial statements um, uh, as well as your, your, your budget numbers um, 
as they, they do pretty much on an annual basis anyway. Uh, in terms of depreciation, that's a non-cash charge, as you know, so that's something they kind of back out looking at cash flow to make sure that you can cover your obligations, but they'll certainly go through all of your financial statements. And that's also, just to interject, why we've always been so cautious over the years about building up reserves, putting money into reserves, making sure that our reserve accounts are good and strong, because that's a key Absolutely. factor, isn't it? Absolutely. As, you, as um, I mentioned earlier, the college has great um, ratings, high investment grade ratings, um, and one major factor of that um, is obviously your, your ability to, to be able to, to levy the appropriate tax or, or, or generate other revenues to pay for the debt service, but also the fact that you have um, substantial reserves in your, your general fund that are unrestricted and can be there to, in case you have a, a problem, a hurricane or whatever. Uh, so again, going on this schedule, ultimately then we would uh, right now expect to, to price the bonds or, or set the actual interest rates um, in July uh, on the 18th. Um, and then we would close on August 9th. That's when the funds would be delivered. Uh, this would all be in time for um, uh, Dr. Wes and, and, and uh, Mr. Johnson to go ahead and work with Lenore to set your, um, your tax rate and make sure that that is done prior to uh, the end of this fiscal year going into 2019. Um, and then finally on the, uh, the kind of the, the participants, um, again, I'm here with um, Tom Spurgeon and Jay Juarez from McCall Perkins and Horton. We're sitting in the audience and certainly can ask or answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we're, we're, um, we are planning on using the, the underwriters listed there, Wells Fargo, our senior manager, Ross Bank, uh, Hutchinson Shockey, Mesero Financial, and RBC Capital Markets. Uh, those are all underwriters that you've either, uh, all of them except for RBC, you've right. used on a number of transactions, and, and they've all paid attention to the college and continue to give you updates and, and various ideas. Um, Underwriters Council will be selected um, going forward, and then uh, the paying agent who you've been using is Bank of New York Mellon. So with, with that, are there any questions? So on the 28th, we will sell everything we need for fiscal year 18 and 19. Okay. okay. And so we won't do this again until sometime in ni late 19 or 20. Well, right now it's scheduled to, to um, the next transaction would be in 2020, so in the summer of 20, approximately the same schedule. But obviously it ultimately is driven by whatever the construction schedule is. If, if the need comes up that you need funds earlier or you need to delay, then we'll adjust the bond schedule to, to mimic that. Okay. And you'd made a statement about the refinancing was uh, eliminated by the legislature. Right. Do you have a rationale for for doing away with well, that opportunity? It's, um, it's off topic, but I, but you mentioned right, it. Right. So um, during the, if you do an advanced refunding, for example, in the case uh, where you've got debt, let's say it's called in 2021, if we did an advanced refunding today, uh, then the bonds, um, the old bonds would still be existing or outstanding until 2021 but there would be new bonds to in their place until then. So during the period of the escrow, there's twice as many tax exempt bonds in the marketplace. Um, we could go into a long discussion about the logic of whether or not that makes a difference, but and that was the rationale. They didn't want as many uh, tax exempt bonds um, in, in the marketplace. Because when tax rates were low, and I realize their, their, excuse me, interest rates were low and they're climbing now, but when interest rates were low, it made sense to do a bunch of advance refunding because we save the tax taxpayers well, dollars. And it's so yeah. I, I, I find that rationale really interesting that they did not allow that option, uh, no longer allow that option to save taxpayers I, time and money uh, on the cost of money. I agree with you completely. It's a great tool for for uh, you know public entities to have to be able to restructure debt, refinance, take advantage of savings, mm -hmm. and so it's a great. Yeah. You've done it a number of times exactly, right. and, and, and it's very common, and, and that don't really. I understand the complete logic of why it was eliminated, but unfortunately it has been. I want to make sure I understand this correctly. In, <coughs> in the year 2022, is our tax rate for the uh, debt service 9.4 cents? Uh, yes, sir, without doing any kind of... I, I, yeah, I this, is, this is with reasonable structure, without doing anything, and then this also assumes, obviously, the, the growth rates in terms of um, uh, the, the assessed valuation on the left-hand side, and then the interest rate assumptions that we have. So it's about four cents higher then. Yes, sir. Resolutions were drafted by Bond Council. Yes, Tom, Tom Spurgeon and um, yeah. Jay Wars again in the audience. Tom, if you want to. And there's nothing new or different from other resolutions, similar resolutions? Uh, no, sir, they're, they're really not. Support. These are very similar to the resolutions you've had in the past. Dave's done a great job of, of really summarizing all of the key terms to that, including the fact that it's a delegation that you all have done before, which uh, either the, the chair of the board, the president of the college, or the chief financial officer would sign off on the final terms um, following the pricing. But 
Yes, these are essentially uh, similar to what you've had in the past. Okay. Yes, sir. And the agenda matches the two resolutions, 4A, 4B. We would need a, a motion and a second and a vote on each one separately. Is that correct? Yeah, right. And they're in your packets. Any further questions before we call? Yes, did you have some more questions, when, please? When do we see the, the blanks filled in? When, when will the board see and, and, and that's a great question. The, um, the resolution you have in front of you really is complete uh, with the idea that the final terms of the bonds will all be included in Appendix A or Exhibit A to the back of each of those. That that's what will be executed by a, uh, one of your designated officers. Then some of those blanks inside there, including day-to-day -day of the bonds um, and some other things like that, and uh, redemption dates, all that's in the form of the bond, that will actually be filled in following the pricing. There's authority under the resolution themselves allowing us to complete that and so that when you have a, a final resolution that goes on your books, um, it, it has all those final terms in one place. So, so the pro that July? In July. Yeah, so there's some no. built-in tag dates. We don't prove it again. We are with today is proving a process that allows staff to execute I, I'm based just on wondering when we'll see it. You won't until after it's done. Yeah. Because so we never have, because we, we are, it's a process where we're approving parameters, mm -hmm. an agreement to go to the market now, and, they've, and that the basic language and that they didn't fill in the blanks based upon market terms at the time and the rest of the disclosures that need to be filled in. And we can but certainly provide executed. you with, with a full... Sort of like closing on a house. When you may not uh, get the final closing uh, statement until the day you go uh, in. On the day, yeah. yeah. And the, but those documents are public once they're right. executed yeah. right. on the closing yeah. date. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll yeah. have them available. The house closing is really the very closest, I think, example because we're, this is the preliminary look. We're all agreeing we're going to move forward on closing the bonds based upon this subject to the terms. Right. And they've got authority now to act. And then once, once it's closed and the document's executed, we have access to the documents. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yep. First time through for you. It is. <laughs> Great. Any further questions? Okay, Regents, we need a motion first on item 4A, which is the resolution authorizing the issuance up to 48.625 million. I'll make that motion, sir. I'll second it. Carol and then Gabe, first and second. Uh, do we have any further discussions on item 4A from the Regents? Any public comments on item 4A? Hearing none, let's just to be safe to a roll call vote, if you would please. Dr. Adame? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Watts? Yes. Item number 4A, uh, we need a motion and a second for the resolution to authorize the issuance up to 61.5 million in bonds. 4B. 4B, sorry. 4B, I'll move on that one. That's for the South Ooh, Campus. Gabe got to that first. Anyone want to second it? Second. Uh, I think Ed got there first. I think it was uh, Nick. Sandra. Oh, was it Sandra? Okay. I just wanted to give you Somebody credit. Somebody on this side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it Nick? So, okay. Um, any further discussion on item 4B by Regents? Any public comment on item 4B? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Watts? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Ness Parker? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Ms. Estrada? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, folks. Appreciate all the effort. Another big step in the process. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tom. Thank you um, item number five, discussion and possible action related to the designation of a contractor for the turnkey installation of low voltage in infrastructure for communications, audio, visual, and electronic security systems in response to RFP 2018-01 and authorizing the administration to proceed on awarding a contract. August Alfonso. Thank you. On March 5, 2018, the college issued RFP number 2018-01 for the low voltage infrastructure installation services for the following 2014 bond construction projects. The Emerging Technology Expansion, the Workforce Development Center Building, a general academic and music phase two construction project. The following six <coughs> firms submitted qualification statements and competitive seal proposals for consideration. Carroll Systems, Convergence Cabling Incorporated, National Cabling Services, Rosendin Electric LV, Snyder Electric, and Telefro Communications. The evaluation committee members include the following, Robert Martin, 
Vince Burial, Matt Melton, Jonathan Garcia, Laura Lask Montemayor, Tom Graham, and Robert Duffy. The Low Voltage Infrastructure Standard was designed and developed by Datacom Design Group, the 2014 Bond Technology Firm. I just want to point out that this is the first time Delmar College has con hired a technology consultant for any of our construction projects. The process was facilitated by David Davila and other staff members at the purchasing department. The evaluation committee's recommendation for the contractor for the low voltage infrastructure installation services is Carroll Systems. The proposed contract amount is $1,851,298. Can you tell us a little bit more about Carroll Systems? Uh, Carroll Systems is uh, one of two that have a local presence. Actually, they're 100% uh, local. And they happen to also be the one that begot majority, if not all, of the infrastructure for the 2003 bond and has Very completed all yes. projects in flying colors. We have, we have experience with them. Yes, sir know them extensively consistent for over 10 years so we've, we've worked with them is like this a, a, a one more just right quick Carol sure. remind me or maybe all of us uh, this is one of those items that it's not a specific budget item it's included in the overall budget correct there is an I technology budget totaling one million seven hundred twenty eight thousand in the bond okay. And that's where I'm headed. Are we over budget or under budget than what we expected? Uh, good news. Uh, compared to that budget, we are 118175 under budget. And also that uh, the estimate provided to us by Datacom Design Group was uh, expect a bid of a little over $2 million, And we are 415000 uh, $89 below a uh, professional uh, Which You just said the bid, the budget was $1.7 million. It's coming in at $1.8. Do you yes, not sir. count any contingencies in that? If you look at the 100% of the total bid. Yes, you're comparing. One, let's make sure we. Yeah. We're comparing. You get this, not all of us to the people on the outside get this. So we just, to be clear, we're comparing the original $1.6 million to the $1.7 budget, and we are allocating out a precision. A, a a portion of the overall contingencies to this project. Yes. Okay. So remember earlier, Regents, when we sh when you showed us the uh, the schedule and there was a percent for contingencies, we allocate each set of contingencies for the, the dollars accordingly. So it's the same percent, this 15%. The 100% okay. bid, thank you, uh, was is one million six hundred and nine and eight hundred twenty-five dollars. Got it. Uh, 241 and 473 dollars is a 50 percent uh, contingency allocation designated by the team. Uh, that is, in the event that part of the contract requires additional work, we don't have to go out for another bid. And I'm okay with that, but are those two numbers supposed to equal the 1.85 and 1 billion? Yes. yes. And also, I just want to point out that in the event that uh, uh, any of the contract uh, within each of the three discipline goes above uh, the estimate. It will only be uh, access control and security that uh, uh, the college would outsource. The college, the college has the capacity to perform any of the low voltage infrastructure. And I'm looking at your nonverbals, and I think you've got a follow-up question. No, no, I'm good. I'm okay, I'm going to make sure. Yeah, this is a very good proposal, sir better than market expectation. Okay. We had a very good vendor, uh, <coughs> all turnkey. Other questions for August on item number five? Just, uh, you said this is the first time we hire a communication expert? Uh, yes, sir. Datacom Design Group yes. was a two, uh, 2014 bond consultant. Uh, we did an RIP for a consultant, and you all uh, approved the selection and designation of Datacom Design Group. And they're a national firm. And so uh, because of this work, we, Delmar College, now have standards for both, uh, for all low voltage. And low voltage com uh, is composed of 
voice and data, all, dig uh, all yeah. digital and audio video, and now for the first time, uh, access control and security infrastructure. I'll second your motion, Carol. Oh, so make a motion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> motion to so approve, We sir. have a motion from Carol uh, and a second from Gabe. Any further discussion by any of the regents? Any public comments on item number five? All, all in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, August. Thank you, sir. Item number six, discussion on possible action related to the college's quarterly financial statement for the period ending February 28th. John Johnson, welcome back. Well, based on all the discussions we've had about the budget, I don't think there'll be any surprises in my in my, the statements I make today. <clears throat> if you look at the current operating statement for the first six months, you'll notice that our revenue for tuition and fees is down 7% over last year, and that constitutes about a $1.8 million reduction in tuition. So we are anticipating that shortfall this year. <clears throat> of course, th that happened because of Harvey, and of course we had a 2% two, two increase in our student discounted tuition. So both those factors <clears throat> work into that 1.8%. If you look at our total revenues, we're at 75% this year, we're at 76% this year, so we're, we're pretty much even, but you're going to see that, that difference change as the year closes out because of the tuition. Um, total salary and benefits were right on target on budget. If you go down to the non-salaried items, you'll see that we're at 37 percent this year versus 44 percent last <coughs> last year. So we're down se seven percent. <coughs> Will we make any of that up in the summer? Hmm? Will we make that tuition up in the summer, especially with summer pay? Um, you would have to have a significant increase um, to Maybe make up seven percent, a one point eight million dollars, because you're t normally your summer tuition for both summer one and summer two adds up to about three million dollars in total. So you would have to have a huge increase in your summer enrollment to come more any cl anywhere close to making up one point eight million dollars. But, but with summer Pell coming in, mm, no. you know, I'm sorry. What 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 I do when I when I'm looking at tuition, fall and spring normally, and and I have this um, calculated out for about seven or eight eight years makes up about eighty four percent of our total tuition for the year. <clears throat> the, the remainder, 16%, is what we do in summer one and summer two. So you would have to grow yeah. huge amount to, ma <laughs> yeah. to make that difference up. And Pell, yes, will help, mm -hmm. but I've already taken that into consideration in that 1.8. You could see anywhere from 1.8 to 2 million. It all depends on what happens with, the, with Pell in the summer. <clears throat> and since I don't have any comparatives from prior years, from there's prior nothing years. for me to go on. Yeah. The um, <clears throat> excuse me. The property taxes. We had we have a contingency of six hundred thousand because of the the uh, protest by industry. So we're in fine shape in that area. I think we will make up a large portion of that six hundred thousand dollar contingency. Of course, it's a little bit early to tell, but I think you will easily make up about three hundred thousand dollars of that contingency. That's that's what I think right now. Based on we're at 94 percent of collections, as of yesterday we were at 96 percent of collections, so I think we're in good shape. Our non-salary items: you have one big item that's consultants and contract <coughs> consultants and contract labor, which is which has gone down by uh, what is it uh, over a million dollars. Of course, that's a timing issue. It's hard for me to predict when those costs are going to come in. But at this point in time, when you look at most of the categories, people are holding back expenditures. We're re really waiting to see what's going to happen when we come into May. And May will give, give us a good projection of where we're going to be at year end. We'll have our um, enrollments for summer. We'll know how our, ta our full taxes have come in. So at that point in time, if we see additional dollars available that we've held back for different projects at that point in time, We'll, we'll let those uh, budgets go so that they can spend those, those particular dollars. And that was 
and that was one point nine million dollars that we in effect pull and held. Exactly. That was that mid year adjustment that you saw for one point nine million. Questions? Okay, Regents, we need a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second? Second. Second. Okay, Carol. Any further discussion by the Regents? Any public comments on item number six? All in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we're going to go into general public comments at this point. Um, Anyway, it looks like we have someone who signed in, and of course you still can address us if you like. Uh, just as a reminder, is uh, the public comment provisions are up on the screen at this point, and then uh, there will be a timer for your three minutes when you come forward, and I'm going to invite uh, Jack Gordy up. Mr. Gordy, are you still here? Mr. Gordy? Come on down. Welcome. Yes, my name is Jack Gordy, and I live at 4118 Bray Drive. And I'm here to make a public comment about one of your closed session items there, about the statement that was in the article that was written by Regent Guy Watts. I read that article. I don't know how many of you up there read the article that was in the paper, but you're going into closed session to discuss that article. You should have read it. There was nothing wrong with that article, nothing. It didn't say anything bad about Del Mar. It didn't say anything about regents, and it didn't say he was a regent. Nowhere in there. So there's no reason to discuss that in closed session. No reason. There's excuses, and that's all I hear from this board, is excuses, excuses, excuses. There's no reason. And the only excuse you got is you don't want the public to know what you're talking about. Public comment, to me, means a lot. Evidently, to this board, public comment don't mean nothing. A freedom of speech, I mean. Because what he's saying, there's nothing wrong with it. He ain't done nothing that's against the law. It's just against this board wanting the public to know what's going on. It should be discussed out here, not in closed session so it can be kept a secret. And that's exactly when you come out, you won't talk about it. So you're keeping what you're talking about and what you've got to say a secret. And people don't like secrets. And we don't know in November they don't like secrets. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Anyone else who would like to address the board? Please come on down. Since I don't have a card on you, be sure you identify yourself if you don't mind, please. Yes, I will. Thank you. I apologize, this is the first time that I've gotten bold and come before you. Welcome. My name is Ophelia Chavez. I live here in Corpus Christi. And actually, I'm just a cons concerned taxpayer. My first concern is that I know of two faculty members here at Del Mar that were terminated <coughs> for bringing out concerns they had. Did they not have that freedom of speech or that right? Secondly, one of you has said that you were the only CPA on the board. However, you lost your CPA licensure. Therefore, you misrepresented yourself. Or did you lie? My third concern is the chairperson of the Del Mar Works. You were asking for donations to pass the bond for the Southside campus. Is that not a conflict of interest? I say yes. Some of you voted to increase tuition. In my opinion, to be more, have more compassion for students, some that are low income students, could you have considered a decrease in administration salaries? Here's another concern. I understand that one of the board members is being reprimanded for freedom of speech. Do we all not have that freedom of speech? When are you going to reprimand yourselves? 
some of you are voting for tax abatements. You're only hurting us, the taxpayers. We, the taxpayers, are watching you. And we'll show you that November the 6th. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address the board that hadn't signed in? Okay. Uh, if you will remain in your seats while I uh, read the closed session language. We're going to go into closed session uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer, offer with possible discussion action open session in the seeking legal advice from counsel on pending legal and contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session and B, Texas Government Code 551.074A1, personal matters regarding employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, including one, the annual evaluation of the president with possible discussion and action in open session, two, regents' duties, responsibilities, and statement of ethics, including March 2nd, 2018 article and other statements by Regent Guy Watts with possible discussion and action uh, including under bo board bylaws 1.1 and Del Mar College policy B2.14 in open session. Our regents will take, uh, we're dismissing or recessing rather at 1044 while we clear the room and we will take about a five minute break. Thank you. It is 520. It's 5.20 p.m. and we're coming back out of um, closed session. Does anyone have a motion that they would like to make? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a motion uh, that in accordance with Section I or Roman number 1.J of the Board Bylaws and B 2.1.4 of College Policy, I move that we authorize the Board Chair and our General Counsel to, invite in, to initiate an investigation, including engaging an outside investigator if necessary, determine if Regent Guy Watts has again violated a specific statute or law, board bylaw or board policy defining the board members duties and responsibilities including bylaws 1.8.2, 9.B, 9.E, 9.G, 9.N, 9.P, other college policies and the board's code of ethics. The investigation may include a review of whether there has been gross ignorance of duties or gross carelessness in the discharge of those duties. That's my motion. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I second that motion. We have a, we have a motion by Susan Hutchinson and a second by uh, Dr. Nick Adami. Regents, uh, any further discussion about the motion on the table? Any public comment about the motion on the table? Okay, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Dr. Adami? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mrs. Strada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Yes. Ms. Ms. Barger? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Motion carries unanimously with those present. Uh, just for the record, uh, Mr. Watts left before the closed session um, began and did not participate in any of the uh, discussions. Um, next on the agenda is calendaring. We're getting to the end of the semester. That means all sorts of good events and pinnings and um, graduations and all sorts of things. Um, May is, uh, the board day is the 8th. Um, as I always remind you, hold the morning open just in case we need a workshop. We're not sure at this point. Um, and then May 11th is the spring graduation. You need to be there by 6.30 at American Bank Center to robe up and the graduation is at 7. The Branch Academy graduation and um, Collegiate High School graduation is the following weekend on the 18th and I believe we have some representatives of the board going to that. Uh, June, the CCAT conference is in Fort Worth on the 1st and the 2nd. Uh, the June 8th and 9th are it's the annual foundation fundraiser, uh, the Stringers for Scholarships. Uh, the uh, regular meeting and workshop on June uh, 12th, board day on July 10th. Called board meeting, you will notice we're beginning to slide in at least the tentative dates for uh, the litany of meetings that we have related to uh, budget process and, and tax hearings. So July 30th at 12 noon, and then if you flip to August, you'll see the August meetings, the board day on the 7th, the public hearings on the evenings of the 20th and the 23rd, and the budget approval on the 28th. Uh, I believe in addition, uh, Claudia's going to come up. And, well, she passed out for us just a reminder that uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., 
is the Del Mar College and Christus Fond Health System uh, Skills Development Fund grant announcement for, for ha uh, half a million dollars, 500,000. Uh, and we'll have uh, Commissioner Ruth Hughes from the Texas Workforce Commission there. And that's at the main lobby at Christus Fond Shoreline uh, downtown. So hopefully you can make it for that. That's a, another exciting um, opportunity. Do you think you'd like to say about that, Dr. Mark? Well, that's going to be an exciting time. $500,000, I think, is our biggest um, skills develop, single skills development grant out there. If it's not, it's certainly up there in the top two or three. That's a big deal, and, and we have close partners with all of our hospitals here locally. That's going to be a great thing. I just want to say that this Thursday uh, is Bernie's Crawfish, and so starting at 530 uh, over at Concrete Street, just want to plug that. Great. Any other calendar announcements? Great. We are dismissed at 524. Thank you very much.